This is Jocko Podcast number 107 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. So the battle of Idrang Valley was over for now. And we just spent two podcasts talking about it. And one of the things that you forget sometimes about the military is that the machine rolls on. Mm-hmm. The machine rolls on. There's work to do, and it doesn't. It doesn't matter what you've been through, or what you experienced, or how many men, or friends, or leaders you lost. The machine is going to roll on. There's still work to do. At least it's going to try and roll on, and that means normal things are going to continue to happen. Meaning that. People are going to get reassigned. People are going to leave the army. People are going to retire. People are going to transfer. You don't stay together. You don't. You don't stay together with these guys that you just went through whatever you went through with. And as much as you might feel like a family with that group of guys, you're not going to get treated like a family in the military. It's the machine is going to roll on. And with that in mind, to close out. The book we were soldiers once and young That again was covered in podcast 105 and 106 I'm gonna read one more passage from that book and here we go back to the book every morning during those final bittersweet days of my command of the 1st Battalion 7th Cavalry Sergeant Major Plumley would appear with a group of men bound for the airfield and the plane that would take them home for discharge specialist for Pat Selleck of the recon platoon says, Colonel Moore shook our hands and said, thank you, and go back home. I was the second or third guy he spoke to, and he had tears in his eyes. I remember what he said. I see that you're married. You have a wedding ring on. Just go home. Pick up the pieces and start your life all over again. And basically, that's what I did. I came home to a wonderful wife, tried to readjust, did a decent job at it. I did what Colonel Moore said. I tried to put the war behind me. I served. I did my job. I came home. I didn't ask for anything. No fanfare, no parades. I went back to work, back to school, and did my best. He might be a general but he's still Colonel Moore to me. If it wasn't for him and all his knowledge and training, I don't think any of us would have survived the Idrang Valley. On Tuesday, November 23rd, the day came for me to turn over command. For the change of command, I requested a full battalion formation with officers front and center, the division band trooping the line, honors to the reviewing officer and colors, and then pass in review, reminiscent of our weekly retreat parades back at Fort Benning. I requested that Captain DeDurick's Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, and Lieutenant Sisson's platoon of Alpha Company 2nd of the 7th be included in the parade of 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, in token of the fact that they fought bravely alongside us in the battle at X-Ray. And so it was. The band played Colonel Bogey and the Washington Post March and Gary Owen. General Kennard pinned on my eagles and I spoke briefly and with deep emotion. Spec 4 Ray Turner of Alpha Company 1st Battalion said, We stood in formation, with some units hardly having enough men to form up. Colonel Hal Moore spoke to us and he cried. At that moment, he could have led us back into the eye drag. We were soldiers. We were fighting men, and those of us who were left had the utmost love and respect for our colonel and for one another. As I reflect on those three days in November, I remember many heroes, but no cowards. I learned what value life really had. We all lost friends, but the bravery they showed on the battlefield will live 
forever. Well, we have tried here to remember and display and spread the word on some of that bravery that was shown on the battlefield so that it does live on. And I think that is the least we can do. That and learn. Try and learn. We must always try and learn. And we can certainly learn from a man that had been through so much and was so respected and revered by his men. And so today we're going to delve into another book. And this one is actually by General Hal Moore and co written by another Army vet. A younger army vet, another author, Mike Guardia. And the book is called How More on Leadership. And it's just that. It's principles and thoughts about leadership that Hal Moore learned and then implemented throughout his life and his career. And again, if you haven't listened to podcast 105 and 106 yet go back and listen to those podcasts first because that'll give you some context as to what general moore lived through and why we should pay attention to what he has to say so again the book is how more on leadership the subtitle is winning when outgunned and outmanned kicks off in the prologue it says All of one's life is a learning experience. I learned a lot of lessons along the way. I'm still learning. These are values, principles, lessons I've learned, mistakes, successes, and my thoughts on leadership from watching, studying, and reading about leaders in action. Good leaders, mediocre leaders, and bad leaders. So, he wrote this book. This book only came out I actually have to check. It came out very came out in 2017. So this book is at the end of of Hal Moore's life. And here we go. We're going to jump right into some of these principles. He starts off with four basic principles of leadership. Principle number 1, three strikes and you're not out. In the game of baseball, three strikes and you're out. Not so in the game of life. Three strikes and you're not out. There are two things a leader can do. He can either contaminate his environment and his people with his attitude and actions, or he can inspire confidence. Good point. Hmm. There's always another way in life, right? Sure. Three strikes, four strikes, you can keep swinging. (laughs) There's no umpire to call you out. Back to the book. He must have, have and display the will to prevail. By his actions, his words, his tone of voice, his appearance, his demeanor, his countenance, and the look in his eyes. He must never give off any hint or evidence that he is uncertain about a positive outcome. So that's something that, you know, we saw in action in the book. We were soldiers once and young when, you know, Rick Roscola comes up and says, where are they at? Good. I hope they bring in everything they got today. Just even though inside he admitted he was worried. Yeah. But and then you hear the reactions of the other guys. They were saying, "Well, that's cool. at least this guy's in the game. Look, I'm I'm game. If he's yeah. game, let's go." Yeah. Do you think that that could elicit some sort of a blowback? It I mean, definitely just that, could. That, it that definitely rule. could. In fact, I have my note there. You want to see my note right there? It says, "Can you read that?" It says, "Really?" Yeah. Because it's it's one of those things <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You're right. It and does. if you roll in and you're getting smashed and you show. You can can seem oblivious to reality. Yeah, 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 exactly. He addresses that. Stand by. Here we go. Back to the book. It struck me early in my reading in school and later in life that is a common theme running through books and stories about great leaders was their positive outlook, positive mental attitude, PMA. For all those Bad Brains fans out there, they were aware of the pitfalls. They were, this is your point, they were aware of the pitfalls and negatives but they refuse to fret and worry about them. Mm. 
So there you go. We're not talking like, oh, this isn't happening over there. Like, remember Baghdad Bob? Are you old enough to remember that? No, but I think you mentioned uh, Yeah, Baghdad Bob while tanks were just, while the Iraqi army was getting obliterated in the first Gulf War, mm-hmm. he was sitting there going, oh, yes, we've had many victories. <laughs> you know, yeah. he just completely oblivious to what was happening. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's, li- the, I think there was literally like bombs going off in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Baghdad Bob. Okay, here we go. Back to the book. Principle number two. There's always one more thing you can do to influence any situation in your favor. And after that, there's one more thing. And after that, there's one more thing. And after that, one more thing. The one more things you do, the more one more things you do, the better your chances are for achieving success in any situation. Elite. This is interesting. A leader must create time to detach himself mentally and ask one of my what am i doing that i should not be doing and what am i not doing that i should be doing to influence the situation in my favor hmm. so he's talking about detachment mm-hmm. i agree with him clearly yeah that's a good it's good to have those like specific things to ask yourself when you detach. You know how like, well, yeah. I'd, I'd always ask yeah. myself like, okay, what do we have here? But even that, mm. that's like a broad question. That's too broad, you know? right? Yeah, that's like, that's way better. That's good. Yeah, if you think about, if you think about your life, yeah, and you you were constantly saying like, what what sh- what should I be doing right yeah. now? Yeah. And what should I not be? Doing? We're all doing things that we should not be doing, right? Yeah. Well, you know, not me, but yeah, man. Oh, you're you're just yeah, perfect, perfect. <laughs> so we're all doing <laughs> things that we life. we we know we shouldn't be doing, yeah. and we all know that there's things that we should be doing that we're not. Mm-hmm. So detach, look at yourself, do an assessment. Yeah, I'm sure that's like a gold mine of things you can change right there. For just sure, those two questions. Are For wrong. sure. Jeez. Here's, here he says, a leader is paid to do three things. Get the job done and get it done well. Plan ahead. Be proactive, not reactive. Exercise good, sound judgment in doing all the above. To get the job done, the leader must have a clearly defined mission along with specific goals and objectives. So, there you go. Brandon Pickworth hit me up. Sure. Because the last podcast I was talking about goals and he had sent me a text about getting belts, I think it was about getting belts in jujitsu. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what it was. But anyways, he was basically calling me a hypocrite. Because, <laughs> you know, my 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 thing is like, hey, you train to get better. You don't yeah. train because you want this thing, right? Sure. Yeah. You train because you you have a, a I should say, see it's not that it's not that there's no goal there, but mm-hmm. your goal is different. Your goal isn't a material item of cloth. Yeah. Your goal is to get better at jujitsu. Brandon, Yeah, you're on lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear a very seemingly far-fetched analogy to that, but it's not. So the other night, I was, uh, was making arts and crafts uh, with what, my daughter. With Presley? Yes. Or were you just chilling out doing some <laughs> <No>. paper mache? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, what did she do? She, she, basically, I said a joke. Right. Mm-hmm. And then she laughed at no no, she said a joke mm-hmm. and then I laughed. Mm-hmm. And then so she said, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this joke again and laugh again, just like how you did before. Yeah. So I'm like th- so I thought about that. Of course I did it. Mm-hmm. But weak <laughs> <laughs> story of my life right there. But um so she says it, I do it right. Then I'm thinking, like, isn't that interesting? She got the laugh, and that was a big payoff. Yeah. But here's the thing. In a way, she shouldn't be focusing on the laugh. She should be focusing on saying funny jokes. The laugh just Bro, comes she's with four. it. Would you take it easy? <laughs> no, I didn't tell her that. I didn't sco- but you see what I'm saying? Yeah. No, same thing. Jujitsu. You focus on getting better at jujitsu. The belt will come as a, as yeah. kind of like a result, a little byproduct, if you will. Yeah. Just like the laughs. So you know, when you're telling jokes, go for the funniness, not for the laugh. The laugh will. I'll come. talk to Presley. I'll pull her aside. <laughs> Have a little chat with her. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, Brandon Pickworth, you know, maybe he'd, you know, find that very enlightening. Mm. Just saying. Tighten him up. <laughs> <laughs> he did, by the way, he did do his 100 burpees in sub 10 minutes. He actually got it. I forget what his time was. Yeah, I never, video, I video never went back there to, to do that, man. Didn't was, you did it easily? Didn't I you do did, it easily? I did it. Uh, it depends on what you mean by easily. 
You did it or not? I did it. Okay, for sure. cool. I did it with the. Then might as well say it was easy. <laughs> yeah. No. Did you have minutes to spare? I had a, I, I had a minute to spare. If I remember correctly, I had one minute to spare. And I knew that at the, like the mm. last. So like, you coasted, cruised. Yeah, I, I coasted into the yeah, finish line. Cool. Weak. It was still kind of. I was sore the next day. I was actually sore. Really? Yeah. Brandon on his video, he did good burpees. I'll give him that much credit. Yeah. Better burpees than my normal burpees for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like yeah. his burpees look, they look clean. Yeah. Yeah. So mine. I, they didn't merit like twelve minutes. <laughs> but sure. he got that down. Yeah. Yeah. If you would have saw my burpees and said, hey, those aren't full, all of those aren't full burpees, I would not be surprised. Put it that way. <laughs> I still can't really know. All right. Going back to the book. The smart leader should always think through the what ifs and have a plan on how to handle them before they occur. Time so spent is never wasted. Things do not always go as planned. So, again, he talks a bunch about planning and he's like, yeah, things don't go as planned. And, and we all have to remember that. Mm -hmm. The smart leader must also be mindful of his organization's constraints and center of gravity. There can be one or several constraints that inhibit getting the job done, and I think we all kind of understand that. And he says that the constraints must accurately be defined. But the center of gravity idea was a, was a little bit more interesting to me. Here we go to the book. The center of gravity is the principal thing or activity that must be in balance or under control for an organization to operate. It is the organization's source of strength. In addition to understanding your own center of gravity to protect it, you must recognize and attack your enemy's or competitor's center of gravity to defeat them. In that battle in Vietnam, my center of gravity was the landing zone. So he's talking about the I Drink Valley, and he knew that and locked that thing down and fought hard for it. Dean, I was training with Dean, I don't know, a few months ago, and then he was teaching a class, and one thing he said that was really interesting and really smart about jujitsu is, he's like, hey, when you're on the ground, you can't have your balance attacked, meaning if you're on the bottom, yeah. you can't have your balance, you're already, you're already down there, so you have to mess with the person's balance on top. Yeah. He's like, they can't mess with your balance, because yeah. you're already down there. Yeah. You need to mess with their balance. Yeah. Good point. Huh. Yeah, exactly, it's one of those things. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to that. Yeah, man. There's a lot to that. It, interestingly, it's like now you're because you're talking about like a really deep fundamental concept, one single for one. sure. And a lot of times, we don't learn all of them. Mm. You know, we, in jujitsu and in, uh, obviously in life too, but we don't learn all the fundamental concepts. So even you can go through life and be successful, you know, varying levels, and then get introduced to one fundamental concept that'll just like dang and this is something that you know thing. i know we all know if you do jujitsu you know that if you're on the bottom you got to sweep to get on top you know you you know that you yeah. but what he was he wasn't even saying sweep yeah he was saying you have to you have to attack their balance yeah because you can't have your balance tacked because you're on the ground already yeah you attack their balance and it's just going to open things up he yeah. wasn't talking you're going to sweep every time no you're not yeah. you're going to get the arm lock though you're going to get the, um a position change going to get roll them into a heel hook right mm. yeah he but just, it's interesting when he talks it like when when hal moore or general moore here is talking about not only do you have to know your center of gravity you got to know your opponent's center of gravity so that's what you attack yeah, which is interesting because people would most heavily defend their center of gravity you would think mm -hmm. And therefore, it would be counter to the Sun Tzu principle of don't attack a heavily guarded area, but, or a heavily defended area, but you got to find a way to get through to their center of gravity. Otherwise, yeah. you're not going to put them off balance. You're not going to win. Yeah. Like, that's one of the goals, you know, is yeah. to attack that. Because some people, I mean, even because Dean Tor totally clarified the concept for you, you yeah. know, where it's like, this is going on in the game. Yeah. And, you know, maybe maybe in certain circumstances, it's intuitive, like, okay, I'm going to attack this guy's balance because specifically I'm going for a specific sweep or whatever. Maybe it'll come in and out of your mind. But if you have that clear in your mind that that's part of this whole game that we're playing. Yeah. And, and go back to the Sun Tzu, well, just because this is me figuring out right now is just because you're attacking their center of gravity doesn't mean you have to do a frontal assault on right. it. You should exactly. still flank it. Exactly sure. what I mean. Yeah. What, but now, at the end of the day, now that's part of my goal. You know, my goal isn't just to kill everyone yeah. or whatever. It's like, okay, we're going to attack this this center, center of gravity. gravity specifically because that'll open up what you know for, and everything else that comes with it. Yeah. But it's clarified now. It is. Back to the book. While getting the job done, the leader must plan ahead and create the future. 
He must be proactive, not reactive. Truly great leaders have acuity, are perceptive, aggressive, enthusiastic, can see trends, analyze them carefully and correctly, have a vision, have confidence in it, and can inspire and motivate himself and his people to make it happen. That's a big laundry list of things for a leader to be doing. Mm. That's why leaders, that's why leadership is a hard job. Think about all those things I just rattled off. He must have a positive attitude and must hate the word no. He must have smart, well-trained people to run day-to-day activities. He must check up on them and make sure the job is getting done while he stacks the deck for future success. So you can see right now he's not micromanaging. He's getting people that can do the job and then he's looking forward. Principle number three, when nothing is wrong, there's nothing wrong, except there's nothing wrong. That's when a leader has to be most alert. Complacency kills. Leaders are paid to create order out of chaos. History is replete with examples of leaders who failed because they became too complacent. In the days and months leading up to Pearl Harbor, American military leaders were confident that the Japanese could never strike American soil. Our naval intelligence said that Pearl Harbor was too far out of reach for a Japanese naval task force. They were also convinced the harbor was too shallow for a torpedo attack. Instead of prioritizing the threat from an aggressive naval enemy, the Army Air Corps commander at Wheeler and Hickam Fields put a higher priority on the threat from spies and saboteurs. They grouped the planes together at the airfield to make them easier for walking sentries to guard on foot patrol. But when the Japanese bombers arrived on December 7th, the clustered American planes became turkey shoot targets. Didn't know that. Hmm. Didn't know that. Wrong threat assessment. Yeah. And now you're doing something that's actually going to help your enemy's real attack. Hmm. But it's complacency. Hmm. Pin- principle number four, trust your instincts. Instincts are the product of one's personality experience, reading, and education. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's interesting, right? Mm-hmm. He puts reading in there. You're actually getting experience from reading, and you know who else said that? General Mattis. Mm-hmm. General Mattis, he, he reads, I think he has a personal book collection of like 5,000 or 7,000 books. Personal okay. book collection. Okay. That's good. And he said he, that's to prevent him from being surprised, because if you know history, you know the future. Mm-hmm. But that's a great definition of what instinct is because people think instinct is this something that's some mysterious thing, right? But no, it's your personality, experience, reading, and education. Yeah, as far as the context he's putting it in. I mean, instinct obviously is clearly defined as something else. What is it clearly defined as? <laughs> I didn't say I knew. Oh, but okay. No, no, no. You know how like animals have instincts to. Oh, know, yeah. Well, and we have instincts to procreate, like all this stuff, like okay. that. I mean, obviously, he's talking about a specific concept. Yeah, he's obviously. not talking about the instinct to procreate. Here, no, no, bro. no, no. Something else. But I'm saying, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not that as mystical. Yes, his definition is not mystical. Yeah. It's like, hey, read, learn experience that yeah. your instinct. and then yeah so you you know like how um you know the, your gut feeling kind of thing yeah. so yeah it's me like if you don't have any experience and any uh like you're not reading nothing yeah, yeah. and you don't have any you're not gonna have many gut instincts no you, know? you will and, you'll still have them. yeah just be they'll wrong. be way off yeah yeah exactly <laughs> isn't it right. funny i was talking about this with someone when uh sometimes like with an injury let's say you have yeah. an injury yeah. and you think i'll just do this but what you're doing is actually completely wrong yeah yeah. That happens to me sometimes. Yeah. I'll have an injury and I'll say, you know what? I'll just keep stretching it. Yeah. And it hurts a little bit, but it'll be okay. I yeah. think that's helping it. And I'm yeah. just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> just, just completely wrong. It. Yeah. And the, so let's say you were, you did that just over and over, over and over and over and over and over again, which you probably have. But I'm saying the normal <laughs> person, you do it over. Then the instincts will kind of recalibrate itself. And then yeah, because eventually I go, hey, this like, doesn't work. Yeah. Well, and now my instinct anymore. becomes, hey, Yep. Demobilize that broken wing or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Check. Just like if you don't know jujitsu and you get into a fight with someone oh, who does yeah, know yeah, jujitsu, you're yeah. going to do your instincts that yeah. you know, which is nothing, yeah, yeah. by the way. And your instincts are going to be completely wrong. Completely yeah. wrong. Yeah. But you do jujitsu. Push long this enough. guy off me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or I'll power out of this. Yes. Or I'll, you know, I'll go all, all super hard. Yeah. No, and that's that's a great example. Yeah. And then when you learn jujitsu, it recalibrates your yeah. instincts. Now. Now your instincts are good. Yeah. And proper. 
unless you get one of these tricky guys who knows your instincts. So he's going to base his instincts off of your instincts. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, now we're getting into strategy, though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, back to the book. It's a, Now he's talking about instinct. It's a kind of sixth sense when seconds count, instincts and decisiveness come into play. In quick developing situations, the leader must act fast, impart confidence to all around him, must not second guess a decision, make it happen. In the process, he cannot stand around slack jawed when he's hit with the unexpected. He must face up to the facts and deal with them and move on. When my head tells me to do one thing and my gut tells me to do another, I will always go with my gut. Why? Because my gut, because my gut, as I've learned, is rarely wrong. Now that's that's a bold statement right there. Yeah, you gotta. My if my instinct are telling me one thing and my brain is telling me something else, that is, to me, that's time to reassess what's going on because uh-huh. <laughs> I got some conflicting things happening. Yeah, going because I'm fairly logical in thinking through things, mm-hmm. and if that is getting completely countered by just some emotional feeling which kind of that's what an instinct is right that's that can yeah. be might not even be it can be emotional yeah right that's, you gotta watch out so for you gotta watch out for that yeah one. it seems like in a emotion or a, a situation predicated on emotion strongly like a i don't know a relationship with some oh, somebody yeah. you're like, i'm just gonna go with my in this case not your guts oh, your heart yeah, I'm gonna yeah go with well my yeah heart people say i'm gonna go with my gut yeah you're wrong no 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 yeah you're probably wrong you're on that one wrong. think about it Think about it. Think the logical side. Yeah. Back to the book. Instinct is a kind of caution light, an early warning or a gut feeling which can on occasion result in a far better decision than one based on a logical process. One rule of thumb I learned more than 60 years ago at West Point is if there's a doubt in your mind, there's no doubt at all. In other words, if you know in your heart that an action is wrong, don't do it. One of my sons calls this the rule of doubts. Above all, never try to fake out, deceive, or fool the people under you. Not only is it wrong, but the troops can smell BS from miles away. Mm-hmm. See, and that starts to make more sense if it's something that's wrong. Yeah, then well, then it makes a lot gut. of sense. Yeah. Then it makes a lot of sense. Rather than right. The, the way I heard, would hear this in the teams, I didn't know it came from West Point, but they'd say, if there is a doubt, then there is no doubt, which I guess is the same thing, which is just shorter. If there is a doubt, then there is no doubt. And that means what? Like if Meaning, there's any doubt, then there means there's no doubt that it's wrong. Yes. That's what you're yes. Okay. Or if you're saying, wait, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. It's probably yeah. not. Okay. Probably gotcha. not. Mm. Oh, instinct. Like when ducks fly south for the winter. Wait, is it north or south? They fly south for the winter. Yeah, so yeah. Warmer. That's an instinct, by the way. I don't know what that is. Is that an, an instinct? instinct? Yeah. Oh, cool. Straight up. Just like like if you're a baby, uh, like suckling, you know, mm-hmm. so you can feed, that's an instinct. Interesting. Let's see. Back to the book. Back to the book. The discipline that makes an effective leader begins in the home. In most cases, learning comes through observation and experience. It is through the parents and or legal guardians where we first begin to understand right from wrong and success or failure. In having guidelines and expectations set before me as a young boy, having to toe the line was the standard of every day. While I remember my mother and father requiring discipline and proper conduct, there was an equal balance of love, fun, fishing, reading, religion, and daydreaming. Yes, daydreaming. Discipline. Cool. Daydreaming makes sense, but you don't automatically associate that with discipline. No, you don't. You don't. But if you follow your daydreams all the time, then you won't end up with anything. (laughs) So you have to have them both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next one. No job is ever beneath you. In whatever you do, do it to the best of your abilities. 
Next, the best leaders try the best leaders strive to create a family environment within their organization. A good leader aims to make his subordinates feel that they are valued members of a team. The same loyalty that goes up the chain of command must also go down the chain of command and across the network of subordinates. And and by the way, of course, as always, I'm not reading this whole book. There's all kinds of better detail in the book itself and explanations and I'm hitting the the wave tops, as they say. Sure. I like this one a little bit. The first person you have to lead and discipline is yourself. Good versus poor choices make all the difference in the world. Hmm. Concur. Back to the book. To be a leader, you must be willing to be a lifelong learner. The leaders who fail are those who think they know everything or that they have nothing left to learn. They resent having to learn something new or adapt to a new situation. Got to be humble. This is interesting. I like to do a lot of listening. That way I pick up a lot of good ideas, many from subordinates. When you listen, you know twice as much as the other guy. What he knows and what you know. Also, whenever the boss talked, I not only listened, but I took notes. I still carry three by five cards today. So that's that's a great one. If you let someone else talk, I was doing uh, security detail in Iraq, my first deployment over there, and, I, and we picked up a, a high, high-ranking officer, and we were the security detail for him, and he was picking up some subordinate officers along the way, mm. and it was so interesting how this high-ranking officer, depending on who got in the vehicle, because we met with multiple different subordinate officers of his. Mm-hmm. And this is American guy. What's American, that? Uh, oh said, yeah, these well, are all Americans, okay, okay. all Americans. But the senior officer, he he would barely say anything. Mm. And the guys would get in, and you could hear them. You know, at first they'd sort of listen for a minute, and they couldn't handle it, so they'd just start talking, mm. and they'd tell this, yeah. they'd tell the boss everything. <laughs> It's a great technique. You just sit there quietly and you, yeah. these people are spilling their guts. Yeah. Isn't that a negotiation technique for sure. too? For sure. Yeah. Where you just don't say anything. You just, just don't look say at anything. They'll be like, well. Yeah. yeah you can make people guy. uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's a great way of looking at it. When you talk, you're, and that same thing happens in, in any situation. I've said it before on this podcast. Mm. The more you talk, the less people listen. Huh. Yeah. Just the way it is. Yeah. He had a kind of some challenges getting into West Point and he did get in and he had a couple lessons learned from that Never say no to yourself when you need to ask for something make the other guy say no Mm. That's 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 a good point, right? Like I'm not just gonna say oh echo would never say yes to this So I'm just not gonna ask him. No, I'm gonna ask him echo. Can you make a couple more videos? Yeah (laughs) Worst thing you can do is say no, which is likely yeah well, I, was, I forget if I read this or listening to it, but there's two kinds of askers, people who ask for stuff, right? There's mm-hmm. two kinds. One who thinks like that, where it's like, the worst I can say is no, so might as yeah. well ask. Or uh, the second kind who is like, he, you know, he might say no, but I, you know how like some people, I don't know if you're like this, maybe you're, I don't know, but some people, they're uncomfortable when to like saying no to someone like it's yeah. like you're the bad guy yeah, you yeah, know kind of yeah. like hey can you retweet this charity or something like that and it's yeah like, if you say no you're the bad guy and that's an extreme example of course but the it, people are like that but some people they're if they're i forget the name of the asker but if you're the kind of asker that's like oh the worst they could say no if you're that kind of person and someone asks you you have no usually have no problem saying no but if you're the other kind where it's like dang now he put me into yeah. the in a position to be the bad guy they're way less likely to ask for stuff oh, because okay. they, they don't, don't want to feel put, that way they don't want to put that p- way, yeah, person yeah, yeah, in that yeah, position yeah. so it's like yeah the worst thing they can say no but i don't want to put him in that position because he's gonna feel yeah, like yeah. how i would feel, you know? there's like two kinds of people but it's weird when you get the clash of the kind of person let's say i'm the kind of person who i don't want to put you in the position to say no mm-hmm. so i kind of i'll be real shy to ask but you're the opposite you're going to be asking me for stuff and I'm going to be like, I won't answer you. I'll be bothered by a few, you know, for a few days and be like, man, I can't believe he's asking me to do this. You know, yeah. I can't believe he's asking me to get When you should ride. just say no. 
Yeah. Mm. No, but in my mind, if I say no, now I'm the bad guy. Now you're in my mind, you're at home saying, I can't believe like he won't do this for me. Or you know, you go through all this stuff. But um yeah, that's when you get that clash. Dude, it's tormenting living in your head. Bruh, I <laughs> <laughs> me i'm like no next question let's yeah. move on see but then even when you say like no uh-huh. like a text message fully with text messages you uh-huh. know how you you say it in real life but at least i can see the look on your face like yeah, yeah. you're kind of half joking i see it and all this <laughs> stuff but in text message you say no period <laughs> right that's it so i'm like no i'm Chaco's mad at me Chaco's mad at me for something he's like he, he wouldn't have said it like that he would have you know but so yeah you make it really hard man people read into a lot of stuff then that's obviously you have to read into some stuff to figure out what's going on. Yeah, but, bro. But sometimes people go crazy with that. Bro, are you even married, bro? You got to read into everything. Every little thing you yeah, got to read true. into. Hey, I uh, am married, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so you got to, you know. All right. Back to the book. Never quit. Obvious. Next one. Find a way to turn every minus into a plus. Good. There is a solution to every problem. Some are more complex than others. There's always a way. Uh, While he was at West Point, he learned about toxic leadership. And here we go. They were were putting um, under the command. They're putting his squads. And here we go. Each squad had two different squad leaders. One month with each. I've never never forgotten those two men. The first one was arrogant, was an was an arrogant, sadistic person who screamed and yelled at us, made us do unmerciful physical exercises, apparently with the goal of driving the weak to quit the academy. I despised that man. A leader should never be arrogant, spiteful, condescending, or engage in gossip. To the contrary, he should always act with humility and treat his subordinates with respect and dignity as a leader your words and action have greater impact on your subordinates than you realize thus choose your words carefully avoid sarcasm and flippancy do not insult or take digs at anyone's intelligence remember everyone processes information differently and at different speeds don't automatically assume that someone is stupid or indifferent because they haven't mastered a particular task yet that stuff is so important. This is something that I screw up because, you know, being in a growing up in a SEAL platoon, everyone's always like picking on each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's that called? Verbally sparring and yeah, cutting yeah, each other like, down. You know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And I still have that in me. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I still have that in me. Really? Right. <laughs> it, it, I don't know. Do I not do that to you? <laughs> so what? But I can do that sometimes when I know I should. I'm like, I'll do it to my kids sometimes. I'll yeah. do it to my wife sometimes. Yeah. And and, I, and and sometimes I don't realize it until afterwards. And the thing is, in my mind, I'm kidding. Yeah, like it's all good. Like I'm. I have no ill will. But you know, you can't do that. Yeah. So that's one I need to always be careful of because I have a tendency to treat other people mm. like they're e5s in the seal platoon yeah. with me <laughs> and yeah. that that's not always good yeah especially the wife thing and you mentioned that before the wife thing. yeah um i said it this was the other day january 1st right first day of the new year and i forget what my wife did um yeah i forget what she did but i was like oh, what a loser right yeah yeah and here's the thing i've said that plenty of times mm-hmm. and you know whatever to her and, mm-hmm. and she said it to me or whatever mm-hmm. but not on christmas here's the day th- you didn't <laughs> new year's day. but not on new year's day either way it was kind of it's not like with you if i said that or so or something like that or whatever you'd be getting one, choked there, <laughs> <laughs> there would be a consistent reaction i think yeah 100 yeah, percent consistent uh, yeah yeah you're, you're you right know, you're right where you'd be like yeah it's obviously i don't really think you're a loser right, the right. fact i said it is part of verbal smart whatever right. that's a consistent kind of interpretation verbal shits. yeah and um but so she said back she's like oh first insult of the new year kind of like sure uh, that was her joke back mm-hmm. right like you know the first yeah, yeah new but year that's still kind of a little thing. it's still a little like mm-hmm. and what i interpreted that or read into it um is that dang like it didn't take you much time to start messing with me like that you know like it's like you oh that's that's what she said yeah yeah that's, that's what she my was thinking interpretation her, yeah. Yeah. you were right yeah i Your think i was, was I, correct. I felt it immediately and i was like dang i gotta you gotta be careful with that kind of stuff yeah. if i said that to my brother you wouldn't care yeah yeah 
This continues. Back to the book. Contrary to popular belief, yelling and yelling at and berating your subordinates will not make them move faster, nor will it inspire their loyalty. In fact, it may encourage them to begin plotting your demise. <laughs> Many years from now, your subordinates will not remember what deadlines were met, what sales were closed, what products were shipped, or what training schedules were executed. What they will remember is how you, the leader, treated them. Whether you inspired a climate of trust and dignity or ruled through fear, metrics, and intimidation. It's interesting. It, and again, that's, that's something that I don't do. Like I might take jabs at people in a fun way that sometimes are not as interpreted as fun as I want them to. But I don't yell at people. I don't berate them. Uh, yeah. Don't do anything like that. And this is 100% right. When you see people like that. It's not good. And I, when I started on this, like working with civilians, I think they actually, people actually thought I was going to come and yell and scream. Yeah. You know, and I'd be like, mm, no, I, and Leif and I used to be like, uh, Leif, when we worked together for 18 months, how many times did I raise my voice at you? And he'd be like, zero. Mm-hmm. And we, we sometimes make the audience guess, you know, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And Leif always cracks the joke of like, there's a lot of times he wanted to yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we, you know, like well, that just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that is interesting how people think that you're going to do that. I know. Uh, maybe because. Maybe that's you, good. Maybe. Yeah, maybe that's kind of part of the whole thing, the whole picture, you know. But why do they think that? Do you, maybe because you yell and scream at other situations i don't though well i have a few videos of you yelling and screaming yelling and screaming what i don't know stuff when you get into other stuff you don't never yell and scream at someone oh you mean like i'm like i'm get fired up oh okay well that's a little bit yeah, i mean yeah. I'm, if i'm raising and my voice is being a little bit more poignant escalated yeah escalated that's sure. not screaming though yeah that, so that's not yelling and screaming at someone you know no so maybe they just like feel that they're yeah. like oh that's a lot of um fire coming from mm. this guy and he's real effective in leading people in hard intense situations so then maybe they just draw that connection maybe it's weird but the movies make it too yeah because yeah, people are sure. yelling in boot camp here we go to Another thing from West Point, this is uh, Schofield's Major General John Schofield's of Civil War fame. This is his definition of discipline. So now this is this this is cool because we're talking about a guy from the Civil War, mm. right? Here we go. The discipline which makes the soldiers of a free country reliable in battle is not to be gained by harsh or tyrannical treatment. On the contrary, such treatment is far more likely to destroy than make an army. It is possible to impart instructions and to give commands in such a manner and in such a tone of voice as to inspire in the soldier no feeling but an intense desire to obey, while the opposite manner and tone of voice cannot fail to excite strong resentment and a desire to disobey. The one mode or other of dealing with subordinates springs from a corresponding spirit in the breast of the commander. He who feels the respect which is due others cannot fail to inspire in them regard for himself, while he who feels and hence hence manifests disrespect towards others, especially his inferiors, cannot fail to inspire hatred against himself. So that, again, that what's cool? That might sound all new worldy. That's written Civil War. That's not that's Civil worldy. War, right? Yeah. That's old school. Mm-hmm. And he's still talking about, hey, you got to respect your people. You got to treat them well. That's a great. That's a great definition of how to how to impose. And I use that word. It's, it, it's you're not imposing. That's the point. You're not yeah. imposing discipline. Hmm. You're you're opening the door and showing the way and leading that's what you're doing cultivating an environment of discipline yes very much very nice i like that (laughs) now he goes into the various brands of toxic leaders I'll, i'll burn through these bully leaders those who inflict emotional pain deliver threats and ultimatums hurl insults and invalidate the opinions of others narcissistic leaders those who are arrogant and self congratulatory This brand of toxic leader will often contrast his own abilities against a subordinate's shortcomings. Look at me. I can do this so easily. Why can't you? Insular leaders. 
This brand of leader forms cliques and goes to great lengths to ensure that his followers are shielded and enjoy special privileges. These are all different brands of toxic leaders. Mm. Hypocritical leaders, this is the one you talked about earlier. These leaders live by the mantra, do as I say, not as I do, and rarely practice what they preach. The hypocritical leader will hold his subordinates to a high standard, but won't apply that same standard to himself. As a leader, you should be you should be applying a higher standard to yourself than your people, for sure. Hmm. Enforcement leaders, this is interesting. Enforcement leaders, this mid-level leader seeks the approval of his superiors without regard to his subordinates' welfare. He will consciously follow orders that are bad, unsafe, or illegal only to stay in the good graces of the organizational culture. That's bad. Those guys... Those are bad leaders. You see them in the military. They're just, they only lead, they only they only do what they're told to look good, but everyone hates them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, like you talk to someone that was above them in the chain of command, and they go, oh yeah, that guy's a great guy. Yeah, he's super. And you talk to someone that's below, I hate that guy. <laughs> Isn't that funny yeah. that, 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 that Schofield's definition, he said you cannot fail to inspire hatred. Mm. Well, hatred. Fail. Yeah. Sure thing. Treat people with disrespect. You know that yep. that you know what that is. I think that is psychologically right. Human beings, we want to be free. We want to have. We want to determine our our path. Right. Sure. When you take that away from someone, and just crush it, mm. they 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 spite you for it and yeah. they hate you for it. Whereas if you can say, hey, look, you can do this. You can execute this mission how you want. Echo Charles. Yeah, yeah. You can do what you want. Here's yeah. the goal. You figure out a way. Yeah. As opposed to, here's how you're going to do everything my way. My way. <laughs> yep. Next one, callous leader in similar vein to the enforcement leader. The callous leader has a blatant disregard for his subordinates' welfare or desires. Credit hog leaders. These leaders show ex- show their toxicity by taking credit for an employee's success or contribution. They resent the notion of giving credit where credit is due. Blame shifting leaders, the mirror image of the credit hog is the blame shifter. This leader is quick to point the finger for anything that goes wrong and many times he actively looks for someone whom he can assign the blame. The blame shifter will often maliciously accuse someone of wrongdoing without evidence or probable cause. That's a person that does not take extreme ownership. Hmm. Bunch of toxic leaders that he talks about there. Here's another thing he talks about. As a leader of any stripe, you cannot simply give orders and expect your subordinates to follow them blindly. To the contrary, you must establish a clear intent addressing the why and the desired end state. It will never suffice for a leader to say because I said so as a reason for performing tasks. If you can't justify the rationale of an order to yourself, don't make your subordinates do it. Reevaluate your reasons and find another method. Have you ever said that as a parent? Because I said so. Yeah. Every once in a while, you got to yeah, bust yeah, that no, out. No, no, it's stupid. It doesn't make sense to do that. Yeah. And when you say every once in a while, you got to bust it out, like, 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 like you're saying, it's like an like emer- emergency situation. Yeah. Hey, we look, I'm telling you, you just put your shoes on we gotta go like that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. because i said so yeah i mean that's that's what happens and yeah. you know what happens in the military too where you you don't always have time you know yeah. if you're in a if you're in a combat situation mm-hmm. you know you can't say hey take that building over there and the reason why i want you to do that is because bubble you know you, right. you don't have time to do that yeah. so but you have trust with your subordinates and they know yeah. where you're coming from and all that interesting so really when when you really break it down is you never want to do that ever, right? No. You never want to be just because I said so yeah. ever. Yeah. But but life's not perfect. Well, this is this is the emergencies, this, all the stuff. This is another thing that Leif and I talk about is there's times definitely where I was like, Leif, hit that building over there, right? And this is what's cool. There's also times because I was the guy that was in charge. There was also times where Leif looked at me and said, Hey, Jocko, move your out Humvee over there, and I was like, Oh, okay, because he needs me to do something. Yeah. So we have a mutually supporting relationship. Yeah. It's not about like, hey, I'm the one that's out here barking all the orders. We're doing, we're trying to get something accomplished together. Right. And if he told me to do something, 
I, I know he's got a good reason why. Because yeah. if he had time to tell me why, he would tell me. Hey, yeah. can you put your Humvee over there? Because we're gonna about to you know move guys out in this whatever. Blah 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 blah. Right. I don't need to hear all that yeah. unless unless I've got my Humvee there for a reason. And now he's saying to me like, Hey, move your Humvee. Hey, hold up. I've got good coverage down this road. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. Yeah. Can you push it back eight feet? Yeah, we can move it. Okay, cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, fully. So it's it's good. We we're, we're, we're cruising like that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, but that's good. It's, but as far as like the actual dynamics of why you shouldn't say because I said so because it's not in your case. Let's say you don't have time to explain why, mm -hmm. right? And you they you just say, hey, move the Humvee, right? And you mm -hmm. just move the Humvee. Still, even if he didn't explain why. The reason still isn't because I said so. And you know that because yes, of all that trust yeah, that you no, guys built. The reason, the reason is because there's some tactical situation that that's, you know. that's unfolding. Yes. That, yeah, of course. Yeah. So it's one of those things where ultimately you never, it never, you never should be like, because I said so. Never no. really should. But in the event of not having time to explain or whatever, even though there's an explanation needed, in the event of that ever happening, you need to kind of build trust. Yes. So you can kind of alleviate that Absolutely. for the you know for the lack of time that's or exactly whatever. what i explained to people when i talk about leif and i on the battlefield that we had trust with each other so if we you know if i said to do something he'd yeah. do it and know that i had a good reason for it if he told me to do something i would do it because i know he had a good reason for it and yeah. then later on he'd say yeah you know i need you to do that move that humvee because we had we we were blocking the fields of fire from inside this building like oh okay cool yeah. that's why i moved it we're all good so without that trust being built and you put that on top of my expectation of you to just follow my order mm. without asking why mm -hmm. as a parent mm -hmm. or whatever, that is wrong. That's what you're saying. Under You should not say that should not be a leading slash yeah. parenting. And, and also you got to remember, you can get away with it for a little while, like yeah. a new chief checks into a seal platoon he says hey guys you know do this the guys are going to do it yeah like they're going to do it there's there is a chain of command there is a rank structure yeah but if that's the persistent methodology right. of leadership yeah. it's not going to work for yeah. the long term that's what you got to remember and when you do occasionally say that like when i would say to my guys to do something mm -hmm. they do it like yeah. they do it because they because it was so seldom that i would utilize like some sort of like, hey, do this now. I would very rarely yeah. exercise that that power over the guys. And it would probably, I mean, I'm just assuming now, but, and it's probably because you never went to the because I said so yes, technique. Yes, no, no, no. Yeah. No, I don't think I, I don't think I actually ever said that. So the lesson even is. In, even in situations where I would want to say it. Yeah. <laughs> like, like sometimes I'm yeah. right. Yeah. You know, sometimes I do like, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. And I would, I remember there was a, we were running a block of training and the guys pulled out this certain element of training. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, why did you pull out this element of training? And they're like, well, you know, they had, some, they gave their reasons, which were all wrong. And I, and I was like, sure. I was like, uh, well, no, here's, here's the reasons why you're wrong there and you're wrong there and you're wrong there. But they were kind of adamant. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just say like, hey, Shut up and do what I'm telling you to do. Sure. Put that put that element of training back in there now. Yeah. And I, I held myself back from doing that. And I'm yeah. glad I did. Of course I'm glad I did. Yes. Because 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 here's the deal. If you're right and you can articulate it, I mean eventually I it just took me more time to explain to the guys, hey, look, that element of training, it might not be happening right now, but it could very easily happen again in the future. Here's some examples, here's some places we are in the world, here's other elements that are out there that are doing that same thing right now that we could easily get folded into, so we need to continue to do that type of training. Mm. And they were like, yeah, okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. But that was, you know, that took 20, 20. minutes. Yeah. That took 20 minutes. Yeah. I knew I was right, 100%. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, no doubt in my military mind at all. Yeah. I wanted to just say, hey, shut up and put the element back in training. Still didn't do it. Though. But I didn't do it. It hurt. I Discipline. To do it. Yeah, that's how. I wanted man. to do it. So really, almost ironically, the less that you do say, because I said so, the more you can. Yes, absolutely. Just what I just said before. The more you talk, the less people listen. It's the same thing. Yeah, the more yeah. you demand people do things, the less you can demand of them. The yeah. less you demand people, the more you can. Yeah. 
So the more use that tool very sparingly as a leader, very sparingly. And you know, you kind of went down that rabbit hole, but this one, if you can't, this other thing, going back to the book, I already read it, but I'll read it again. If you can't justify the rationale of an order to yourself, don't make your subordinates do it. Mm. This is something I get asked all the time. They're like, well, what if, what if somebody came up and said, hey, and they told you to do something that you didn't want to do, or that you didn't think was right? I'd be like, I wouldn't do it. Hmm. They're like, well, really? It's like, yeah, of course, really. <laughs> and here's the, this is what they don't realize. They think that everyone in the military is like running around giving orders that are stupid and don't make any sense. That's not true. Yeah. No, you know, when I got told to do things that didn't make sense, one good example of that was, was taking Iraqis with us on the battlefield and they were saying we had to take a ratio of like seven to one or whatever the ratio was at the time and it didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, we're not gonna do that. And I ran up the chain of command. They're like, yeah, you're right. It doesn't make sense. You don't have to do it. Yeah. Take what you can. And we were like, okay, cool. But there's a there's a perfect example of me being like, you know, I'm carrying the line, I'm a company guy, I'm all on board for the big win. Mm-hmm. But if you tell me to do something that's stupid, I'm not gonna do it. You know what's funny? I heard that about you. What'd you hear? That that that's what you <laughs> this one, one of my friends, you, obviously we know him, but he'd be like, Jocko's so such a badass. He'll like the way he talks to uh the superiors is like it's so gangster. He'll be like <laughs> he'll be like, No, we're not gonna do that. It doesn't make sense, you know, whatever. And now that you're like explaining it to yeah, me, it yeah, makes yeah. more sense. Yeah, yeah. Because like, I wouldn't be that gangster. Yeah, but you Those know, in, words, in their mind you're the, they're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah, because is- I would be explaining it to him. You yeah. Know? And and you gotta be very careful uh that you're not coming across as arrogant, that you're yeah. not coming across as, a, as a know-it-all, which yeah. sometimes I would have a tendency to come across like that. And yeah. I had to be very careful. I had to check myself sometimes, because you want to, it's the same thing. Yeah. Just like you, just like you want, I want to tell my subordinates, like shut up and put that element of training back in there. Yeah, yeah. You want to tell your superiors the same thing. And you yeah. know, hey, shut up, that's a dumb idea, but you can't do that. Yeah. And all you're gonna do then is, what you're gonna do is you're gonna make them mad at you. The same thing that, that I just talked about going down the chain of command goes up the chain of command too. So mm. if, if I treat, if you're my boss and I treat you with disrespect, you're gonna hate me. Yeah. And it's gonna work out worse for me because yeah. I'm on the bottom side of that, that little pyramid we've built. Yeah. So when I would talk to guys, to my superiors and say that something doesn't make sense, I would do it in a very respectful yeah. way. And again, I had to be careful because sometimes, especially people that didn't know me, if you didn't know me, I maybe the, the, usually the people that didn't know me well, I might come across as more arrogant, you know, mm-hmm. and which is bad. I'm not saying like that. That's bad. I wish I wouldn't. Yeah. But if I didn't believe in something, I wasn't going to do it, and I wasn't going to be a jerk about it. But I like, hey, here's what's going on. If we take these number of guys in the field with this many Iraqis, we're not going to have all the people that we should have in the field to be safe. You know, you're talking about leaving behind a corpsman. You're talking about leaving behind a, a radio man. You're talking about leaving behind a, a close air support fires guy. Those are guys I can't go in the field without, or yeah. someone could get killed. Hmm. And the, the up the chain of command, I was like, you're right, cool. Yeah. And then this didn't ha- again. There would be occasional things, but. It doesn't happen all the time where people are giving you stupid orders. My bosses didn't give me dumb, didn't tell me to do dumb things. Yeah, and I'm sure that's kind of what. And you know what? Sometimes they told me to do dumb things, but they were little dumb things. And you know what I did? We did them. Yeah, yeah. We did them. Little pawns. Little little things. You want to do something? You want me to do something stupid? But it's small, small and stupid. I'll do it. Yeah. And I'll save my my objections to things that actually matter. Yeah. Makes sense. Goes back to that paperwork. You know, Leif talks about doing paperwork. And I was like, yeah. you know, we don't want to do paperwork. And I'm like, hey, we're going to do the best paperwork because it's a little thing. We don't care about it. You know what? So we got to stay up an extra hour and do some paperwork. Who cares? Yeah. We're going to build that trust. And that way, when we come time to say no for real, we'll be able to say no for real. And, and the bosses Results. will listen to us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that, that added to the whole cachet, though. You know, where, where, when you did say something or did push back or whatever, it would st- you'd still get the results, you know, where someone who may not understand that fully as oh, much as yeah, you did, yeah, they yeah. just witness kind of the kind yeah. of the, the end and be like, dang, Jocko's gangster like <laughs> yeah, that. He's yeah. making stuff happen up the chain. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Because, you know, because to my guys, I might be like, hey, guys, we're not doing that. Yeah. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like yeah, my yeah. guys be like, hey, yeah. they told us. I'd be like, we're not doing that. And they'd be like, oh, shit. And then I go to the, go to the, you know, yeah. the boss's office and be like, you know, I, and debrief me, hey, sir, I'm just wondering about this plan we got here. Yeah, here's yeah. I like to do and here's how I like to go. And then I come back, we're, we're not, not doing, doing it. it. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. yeah. Yep. So, yeah, maybe that is, you know, level three gangster. <laughs> All right. Here's another one. Leaders stay informed of current in- events and they should anticipate challenges based on those events. Just be, be informed of what's happening. That makes sense. Here's some other West Point lessons learned. I was able to function mentally and physically in top form with only five to six hours of sleep a night. Just saying, (laughs) take that for what it's worth. I don't advocate sleep deprivation, Uh but I'm just saying there's an example there that you might wanna listen to. Mm -hmm. Another thing that he learned at West Point, read. 
I love to read books and have and have since a very young age. At West Point, I discovered a magnificent library loaded with books on military history and leadership. Ever since then, for more than 60 years now, I've been fascinated by the study of leadership, military, political, business, athletic, etc., and within that, a focused interest in why leaders fail. Remember, a good leader is a lifelong learner who continually studies to perfect his craft. It's interesting to hear these great leaders read mm-hmm. you know again general mattis is the classic mm-hmm. five thousand books in his personal library mm-hmm. hopefully we can get him on the podcast to discuss some of his favorite books okay after he graduates from west point he missed world war ii he goes to japan and he's in the occupation of Japan. Back to the book, I was flown up to Japan in October of 1945 and was sent north on a train on the 11th Airborne Division's jump school, or for the 11th Airborne Division jump school. Arriving in Tokyo Central train station, I was struck by the cleanliness of the place and by the hundreds of Japanese soldiers in uniforms sitting on floors, leaning against walls, all unarmed, no weapons, and showing no anger toward American soldiers. A Japanese rail conductor showed me to a spotless alcove with a short bunk and clean sheets. The train left on time and I arrived in the next morning exactly on time. Here was my observation. These people were six weeks out of a five year war and they had already began cleaning up and disciplining their services. When they get back on their feet, watch out. Even in the midst of defeat, Carry yourself professionally and maintain your discipline. That is the quickest way towards recovery. Interesting story. The Japanese, we just lost a five-year war. We got atomic bombs dropped on us. Guess what? Okay, we lost. Sign unconditional surrender. Mm. Unconditional surrender. That means you have nothing. You have no power. Zero. Nothing. Unconditional. Mm. Unconditional surrender. You know what? Keep your uniforms on. Be squared away. Get the trains running. Clean this place up. Yeah. We got to get back. We got to get back together. Got to get back in the game. It's kind of like if a girl breaks up with you, right? No, it's no, not, not an unconditional no, surrender. No, 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 no. I'm not saying the surrender part. I'm saying the clean yourself <laughs> yes, up part. Clean yourself so up. Saying, for quickest sure. way to recovery. For sure. Don't go yes. drink spiraling, letting yourself for sure. go. For sure. If you get back in the gym, right? <laughs> Start reading. What yep. else? What when else you go, do? when you, when you're, no, you're a hundred percent right. You are right. When you are defeated, yeah. The best thing you can do is maintain your discipline. Yeah. That's the best thing you can do. Maintain your discipline. Yeah. You'd be surprised how quick you get back on your feet. Mm. There's very few people. The only, <laughs> some people are the reason they're they're jammed up is because. They're not paying attention to things they should be paying attention to. Uh-huh. Like they're they're working out seventeen hours a day, and they're not paying attention to their family. Those mm-hmm. are, sometimes those guys get into scrubs, right? Mm-hmm. And I kind of got to say, look, man, you're in good shape. You need to spend some time with your, you know, with your wife, with your kids. Mm-hmm. Give a little bit back, because that that happens to team guys sometimes. Yeah. Got to be careful that one. We're, we're, we tend to be workaholics. Yeah. And the work is so fun that it just like can take over everything. Wait, so so what is that? How does that, does that contribute to their recovery in other situations? Well, or? L- l- let's just say there's a family problem going on, right? Yeah, and so what yeah, does the guy do? He's, he's, he's in the game, right? He's, yeah. he's going to work out even more. He's going to go to <laughs> jujitsu even more. Yeah. But what he's doing, he's not helping the problem. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. This is the uh, most people don't have that problem. Most people have the opposite problem. Yes, when they get yeah. down, yeah. when they get down, they go, uh, you know, I don't feel like working out. I'm just going to drink and yeah. eat pizza and donuts, right? Yeah. That's what most people do. A lot of times, seals will be like, oh, I'm not feeling good. Cool. I'm going to work out harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, oh, uh, my family's not fun right now. Cool. The gym is fine. Yeah. Jiu Jitsu's fun. I'll go surfing on a nine day trip. Dang, that's like a. a a feedback loop kind of right in a way so it's like okay there's an issue with my girlfriend i will make it less serious the issue with my girlfriend mm-hmm. girlfriend's giving me grief whatever i'm not around or something like that or i'm not sensitive to her feelings eh, you know how i'm gonna deal with that i'm gonna go work out and go yeah, hang yeah, with yeah, my yeah. Team guys which makes the problem worse yes, now because yes. you're paying attention less right, right, right. even less sensitive to her feelings with a girlfriend is one thing though with a wife is another thing yeah yeah because the girlfriend the guy will be like oh cool 
the, 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 the wife is a different scenario because yeah. they got kids and they it got all this thing. Yeah, it yeah. means more. It's a big for difference. Sure. You just, you just, your example wasn't good because was, you, was, you took a big, you took what you thought was a small step, but it was a big step. <laughs> too, there's too much of a difference yeah, in the example. Too much different than the example. So same example, wife and kids mm-hmm. as opposed to girlfriend. Boom. Yeah. Feedback loop. Yeah, yeah. You. This is what I'm saying. Instead of instead of the guy going because normal person going, man, I'm not feeling good because my. Because my wife, my girlfriend, a normal guy, it's like, hey, well, you need to get back in the gym, get your game together, get yeah. up early, get on the program. Yeah, yeah. And they'll start feeling good and they'll start feeling good about themselves and then they'll start being a better person and being a better husband. Yeah. You say that to a team guy and they're like, okay, cool. <laughs> I'll work out <laughs> 19 hours a day. Yeah. And the other five, I'll be doing jujitsu <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Next. A good leader studies the culture of any location where he's planning to go and ensures his subordinates are properly educated on the same. Here's a good one. When in charge, take charge. But treat your subordinates with respect and dignity and common courtesy. Here's another one. A worker's performance often reflects the attitude of his leadership. If you want something done, ask nicely. If a subordinate forgets to perform a task, don't take it personally. Just remind them nicely. In any organization, everyone has a to-do list. While juggling these tasks, some things will inevitably fall through the cracks. When this happens, don't assume that the subordinate's lazy or stupid. Simply re-engage them on the task and, if necessary, emphasize why it's a priority. If a subordinate performs a task and the outcome is not what you expected, don't attack their intelligence or character. Politely explain the deficiencies and offer an idea for solution. Subordinates quickly lose respect for a leader who is all problem and no solution. Speaking of problems, wherever possible, solve problems at the lowest level. When leaders are confronted with disciplinary problems, be it willful disobedience, negligence, or honest mistakes, they must resolve these problems at the lowest level before raising the the issue to higher echelons. If the problem can be fixed and a remedy instituted at lower levels, it will benefit your relationship with your subordinates, improve the health of the organization, and not divert higher level resources away from their priorities. Solve things at the lowest level. That's yeah, that's I used to say this exact same thing to my guys. Mm-hmm. Especially when it well, when it came to anything, but the topic would come up a lot of guys getting in trouble. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, if a guy gets in trouble, solve it. Like solve it at your level. Mm-hmm. And if you and if you don't think you can contain it, tell me. What do you mean get in trouble? Like, oh, guy gets in trouble out in town. DUI or gets something. DUI. Well, DUI is a pretty big one, but yeah, guy gets into a fight. Yeah, fight. Guy gets into a fight out in town. Mm-hmm. Hey, if you can, hey, you can punish him. You know, the platoon chief hears about it, and the platoon chief says, oh, I'm going to punish him. He's going to be doing brass pickup or whatever. Mm-hmm. He's going to be doing something. Cleaning the military vehicles is always, you know, one of the best. One, one. Wax the six by. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that, that, you can handle it there. Mm-hmm. You don't need to tell the platoon commander, the platoon, uh, the, the task unit commander, now it could be different mm. if the guy gets in a fight and now he gets arrested because mm. now we're going to hear about it because yeah. the, they're going to find out the guys in the military they're going to want to know talk, contact the chain of command because that's what they do that's mm. their that's their policy mm. and so now they're going to contact the chain of command so now can it be contained that's the question if it mm. can't be contained then you got to run it up the chain of command because you don't want your boss to get get hit uh what's it called blindsided Blinds, right yeah fully hey, one of your Jocko, one of your guys was arrested, you know, yesterday. Why didn't you tell me? You don't want that to happen. Yeah. If you can contain it, contain it. If you can't, you gotta you gotta tell the chain of command. Yeah. But you should try and contain it. Mm. Be like, hey, we got it handled. Boss, there was a guy who got in trouble yesterday. Here's the punishment I dealt out, and here's what we're you know, here's where we're at. Mm. No one wants to be the senior guy with a secret. Have you ever heard that before? Senior guy with a secret. A senior guy with a secret. Hmm. Meaning Meaning, if you did something wrong, mm-hmm. and and I find out about it, that means I'm. I have the secret now. Yeah. And if I'm above you in the chain of command, and now my boss finds out, well, now I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah. So it's be the you easiest, the, the easiest way for me to do it is to be like, "Hey, boss, it, Echo yeah. did this wrong. Makes he got sense. in trouble, yeah. and then my boss now has the secret. Yeah. Well, is he going to tell his boss yeah, fully? Right. That, that's like the friend, you know, who catches. His friend's girlfriend or something cheating on him, and it's like, shoot, I don't want to. Do I want to ruin the relationship or you know? That the relationship kind of is already ruined. Oh, you're right, right, so right. That's well, not a good example. No, it's kind of a good. <laughs> maybe not cheating. Well, no, because there was a movie called, I think it was called this. I don't know if it was called The Secret, but that's what it was predicated on. Mm. 
And so that's the whole thing. He didn't want to, he put it this way. If he told, if he was, if you tell the secret, he would like, I don't know, ruin some relationship. Mm -hmm. And if he didn't, it was like, they'd be fine, but you're the senior with a secret. Then of course, at the end of the movie, you know, they, they find out, you know, the big reveal. Who is that? Vince Vaughn was in it. Anyway. Talk to someone else about that stuff. <laughs> you need to have your own podcast, Echo Movie no. Reviews. No, bro. It's the same concept, I'm telling you. Praise in public, pra- punish in private. I think everyone knows about that. Here's some here's some other lef- lessons he learned when he was uh, occupying force in Japan. Be confident, but not arrogant. Hmm. Self-confidence and humility are the keys to getting any job done. little dichotomy in those two, obviously. There's always a way. Either you find a way or you make one. If you can't think of a way, don't hesitate to ask for help. Take counsel from those who have information and experience. It's so funny how some people won't ask for help. Supervise, check up on things, but don't micromanage. Make sure your subordinates understand their priorities of work. I mean, these, I, I'm, I'm, I just realized I was almost reading those as if like, hey, we already know these yeah, things. Yeah. It's like, like these obvious. are things that we know. Yeah. Um, not that not that they're not important. Yeah. And yeah. obviously, Hal Moore knew him before I did. He learned him in the occupation of Japan. Here he talks about someone that he worked for. The officer under whom I served for the longest period in Japan was Major Mansfield. He was always cool, never raised his voice, very perceptive, took no wooden nickels, and was a natural leader. He told me he, that what he wanted to be done and let me run with the ball. He trusted me and I went an extra two to three miles to make sure I would never let him down, never do a shabby job, or never lose his trust. That right there is this like, you could just give that to people and say, hey, think about this, man. Yeah. If you're gonna be in a leadership position, think about this. Yeah. Always cool, never raise your voice. Give people what you wanna do and let them run with the ball. Like that's just basic stuff, but it's so important. What's a wooden nickel? Wooden nickel is, oh, it's, 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 it means, it means you, take, you take things that aren't worth anything. Oh, uh, yeah. Fake. Fake. A couple more lessons learned. Tell your subordinate leaders your standards at the outset and what you expect. That's a pretty good one. Mm. If you let people get away with stuff for a while, then when you jerk the chain yeah. back, it hurts them more. Mm. Push authority down to make mis- decisions but keep responsibility for the results. Don't blame subordinates for bad results. Blame yourself for not training them properly or giving poor instructions, extreme ownership, boom. That's another parenting one. For sure. Always, me- well, I see it and then I see. I feel like I've done a good job in being conscious of this. You know, how, okay, so if I say, okay, so one-year-old, four-year-old, four and a half, whatever. And I say, hey, you know, watch him. I'm gonna go grab this thing from my car, whatever. Watch him, don't let him climb up on that bike and fall down mm-hmm. he's one so i run in the you know mm-hmm. i come back of course climb on the bike yeah falls down yeah hey i thought i told you not to let you told a four-year-old I, I, I know brad that's what makes the example even more powerful because look <laughs> hey look her failure is my failure that emphasizes my failure even more so four-year-old that's yeah. my failure yeah you but it's the same thing for <laughs> oh, big time check be dead honest with those above you and below you. Totally candid, but not harsh, straight talk. Respect your people. Taking care of your people is not just about the obvious things, pay, working, conditions, concern for their welfare and that of their families, but seeing that they are properly trained and have the personal discipline and desire to get the job done and get it done well. Carry a notebook or three by five cards and take notes when being given instructions or when your boss is explaining his philosophy or guidance on a matter. I also found that when running or doing other physical exercises, ideas and useful thoughts would pop into my head, possibly related in some medical way, blood movement goes to the brain. So I took scrawling notes when running. That's not a bad, I've done that before. I'll be like working out and I'll, Mm -hmm. in my workout book, I'll have a little like four words of something I thought of Mm -hmm. or like, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know if it's that interesting, but it's worth noting. Uh, yeah, I mean, if the, that's true, you know, like where like they're carrying the a notebook around now. The, nowadays, put people put notes in your phone. Do you put notes in your phone? Yes, I put notes in my phone too. 
Yeah. Do you take voice memos sometimes? No, uh, I I, th- I, I saw someone sometimes. doing it. I thought it was so cool, but I the habit didn't didn't stick. Didn't stick. Yeah, it's not bad. I usually type in the notes. Yeah, but sometimes if I'm driving, voice note. Yeah, dang. Okay, see. now he's a company commander in Korea, so Korean War. So uh, you know he. There's again, we're jumping through this book, but this is. The, I thought this was awesome. He takes over as a as a company commander. One of my first acts as commanding officer was to move six men out of the worst boar's nest in the place. These mortarmen had been billeted in a derelict bunker which was infested with rodents. I moved them into the officers' bunks and I moved down there, moved us down there into the first mortarman's old bunker. I had some Korean support troops clean it first though, and it was very adi- adequate for my gunnery officer, recon officer, warrant officer, and myself. A few mice and bugs, but not bad. One corner of my end was dug into an old Korean grave, which was immediately covered, but there is still a lingering odor. I keep my feet down at that end and liberal use of an aerosol bomb and open and opening the door, and it's not bad sleeping at all. These graves are hard to avoid since they are scattered helter-skelter all over these hills where our positions are. So what I thought was awesome about that he takes over his company command. These enlisted guys are living in this crappy, stinky, rodent-filled barracks. He kicks them out, moves them into the officers' barracks, and moves the officers into the crappy barracks. That's what I'm talking about. That is legit. Some more points from Korea. Good leaders don't wait for official permission to try out a new idea. In any organization, if you go looking for permission, you will inevitably find the one person who thinks it's his job to say no. It's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Put the welfare of your own troops above your own. They eat before you eat. They sleep before you sleep. Simple acts of courtesy and graciousness have found profound impact on subordinates' morale, self-perception, and performance. So, every leader is put through an informal process in the first few weeks wherein his people judge him and decide whether or not he's worthy of their trust. He must earn their trust. How? A leader must prove himself by his actions, appearance, demeanor, attitude, and decisions. I like that, you're definitely getting looked at. When you take over something for the first time, you're getting looked at hard. The leader must be visible on the battlefield. He must be in the battle, battalion commander on down, brigade and division commander on occasion. He must exhibit his determination to prevail no matter what the odds or how desperate the situation. He must have and display the will to win by his actions, words, tone of voice on the radio and face to face, his appearance, his demeanor, his countenance, and the look in his eyes. He must remain calm and cool, no fear. He must ignore the dust, the noise, the smoke, the explosions, the screams of the wounded, the yells, or the dead lying around him. That is all normal. He must never give off any hint or evidence that he is uncertain about a positive outcome, even in the most desperate situations. So again, I, you know what you brought up earlier mm. of this, hey, we're not gonna show any fear, we're not gonna show any possibility of ever losing. You know, I don't think he's talking about that. Uh, I think he's talking about even though you might be thinking that and even though you might give the indication, hey, look, if we don't get our act together, we could lose this thing. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to. Some more Korea examples. I'd been taught for years that leaders must set the example and I tried to do so. But in battle is absolutely mandatory and especially so during the Korean War at the company level. I learned that I could keep calm and functional in the bedlam, stress, noise, blood, and killings of a fierce battle. I had no choice but to remain calm. Stay in shape. When we were not in battle or another operation, I took a run in the late afternoon for an hour or so. The first reports from the battlefield are usually exaggerated for good or bad and are not entirely accurate. This is normal since they are sent back by leaders in a moving battle and are fragmentary. First reports are always wrong. That's what we used to say. And that's usually pretty true. Here's a good one. Be ready so you don't have to get ready. A good leader will preposition as many assets and people as he can before an event or as in a contingency in case of disaster. Thus, when the alert and or emergency inevitably comes, you'll be better prepared to respond to it. B 
be ready so you don't have to get ready. Mm-hmm. He talked about when things are quiet, and here he's talking about when things are quiet on the line and nothing's going wrong, tighten up security. Be sure the listening outposts are alert, especially at night, and particularly if it's raining or snowing. That's the most appropriate time for the enemy to close in. It's interesting how he's talked about that tool. He talks about it a bunch, but you know, for him, when if there's nothing going on, do something, right? If you've got a day off, do something to make your position better. If you're not getting attacked, good, improve your position. Mm. Every moment he's thinking about that. When you draw up a plan of attack or defense, you must have information on the weather, terrain, and enemy capabilities, but you cannot coordinate your plan with the enemy. Therefore, you have to think through all the what ifs. If the enemy does this, what happens? If the enemy does that, what happens? It's time well spent. I always say the enemy gets a vote, and that's what he's saying. Yeah, yeah you, 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 can co- you can make your plans, but your plans aren't coordinated with what the enemy's going to do. They're right. gonna, the enemy's going to do what the enemy's going to do. Yeah. Soldiers in battle fight, kill, and die, and die primarily for each other. Don't complain to your boss. He wants solutions, not just problems. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's not just to your boss. That's up and down the chain of command. Yeah. Around Saving Private Ryan when he said, you never gripe down the chain of command. Yeah. Definitely I mean, not. I think that was a different point he was making. But he, Well, it's, it's, well, I just said up or down the chain of command. He's saying don't gripe up. No, he's saying don't gripe down. He's, Gripes he, go up. He he's said. saying, yeah, well, he's saying don't gripe up. Mm-hmm. And you're saying don't gripe down, and I'm saying don't gripe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he's saying uh, don't complain. don't complain to your boss. Yeah, yeah like that's a like, gripe. Yeah, well, yeah. I, mm. the, the way I took it on Saving Private Ryan, anyway, was gripe meaning like I have a complaint about this that I need the answer to, kind of thing. It's more of a comprehensive thing. This Dude, is like, you cannot this seems... you cannot delineate the difference between gripe and <laughs> and complaint. They're the no, no, same no. thing. Well, I feel like complaining because only no, because a complaint he said is I a want little, the solution. A complaint, a, a complaint is might be a little bit more formal than a gripe. A gripe is like, man, I can't believe we're not get, we're getting yeah. the same food again. That's yeah, yeah, a gripe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's also a complaint. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Now, a complaint could also be we are low on ammunition. That's being yeah. beyond a complaint, right? That's like a critical situation. Wait, so gripe is less? You think? Gripe is a little bit less, okay. but they're the same freaking thing. Yeah, and you shouldn't no, do either one of them up or no, down the chain of command. Right. That's, but the unless point. you bring solutions with you. Okay, so so that is what I think was kind of like a given. What I felt anyway in Saving Private Ryan, meaning like, okay, if you have a, a, an official complaint, like, okay, we need to change this. And eh, then again, you might be right because he want he doesn't want you to do it down because it makes you look like a weak leader kind of thing. I'm assuming. With this, he's saying, "Hey, don't just come with all your complaints and no solutions to your to your superiors, because superiors want answers. Not, yeah, they want solutions. Not, yeah. yeah, yeah. But when you gripe down the chain of command, there, there's two things. Number one, if you just complain down the chain of command, then the guys are going to take that and run with it. But that doesn't mean you don't explain things down the chain of command. That doesn't mean you don't say, "Hey, guys, we're low on ammunition. Here's what's going on. Our yeah. vessel." Transport got hit and sunk by a torpedo. They didn't deliver the ammo. We're gonna have, then people go, Shh, damn. Yeah, it's less of a as opposed to just like, can't believe we don't have enough right. ammo. Yes, yes, we don't have enough ammo. This is an issue. Maybe that's kind of what he meant. That only goes up. I would, I'm yeah. trying to think, but both of them, you have to tell your guys that you don't have enough ammunition. You have yeah. to say, hey guys, we don't have enough ammunition. Here's what's going on. I put in for more. the The transport got sunk, and and this is the situation we're in. We need to use our ammo as sparingly as possible. That's not a complaint. No, that's an explanation of what's yeah. going on Same and part. a commander's intent about how much am, ammunition we're going to use. Yeah, and yeah, conserving yeah. ammunition. Yeah. Check. Back to the book, we're getting into Vietnam. Shortly after 9 a.m. on June 29, 1964, I was handed the colors of the 2nd Battalion, 23rd Infantry. Accepting the colors means the commander is now responsible for all his command does or fails to do. Yeah, once you're in charge, you're responsible for everything. Now, 
if you remember in we were soldiers once and young there was the lost platoon which was led by henry t herrick lieutenant henry t herrick and this guy was known to be aggressive aggressive to the point of being reckless right mm-hmm. overly aggressive and his sergeant major and this is this is from the book here sergeant major plumley told him colonel if you put lieutenant herrick in there he will get all of them killed his senior enlisted man his sergeant major told him hey don't put this guy in charge mm. he put him in charge anyways mm. and he regretted that and he said that that was one of his leadership letdowns that he failed to remove a toxic leader from the ranks and and Herrick's soldiers ultimately were the ones that that paid the price and therefore he says when you identify a toxic subordinate leader remove them if you cannot remove them reassign them to a role where their toxicity can be minimized so and i mean herrick that does a and again you have to get the book we were soldiers once and young so you get the whole story because i didn't cover it in enough detail mm. because it's one thing that's going on in that in that whole scenario mm. and and herrick kind of redeemed himself getting the guys together to at least defend themselves for days out in the field being attacked like over and over and over again mm. but it was his hyper aggressiveness that got them in that situation in the first place this is an interesting one he's talking about his troops and he says their duty at their level is just as important as my duty at my level that's that's awesome and I've talked about this before how I always wanted like every guy in my platoon to think that they were the most important person in the platoon Mm. and that's what he's saying and it's right it's not just like I was like manipulating it's like no you're the radio man if we need help, you're the only person that's going to get us help. Yeah. You're the corpsman. If one of our guys gets wounded, you're the only person that's going to be able to save him. You're the machine gunner. You got the most important job on the platoon. Yeah. Without you laying down cover fire, we can't move. Yeah. It's like everyone. Everyone's the most important. Everyone's job is important. Now, he he's actually uh, critical. And, and I got some feedback with with on we were soldiers once and young you know here here's a guy that led his troops into the situation and a bunch of guys died and how is that in any way heroic and that's valid right i mean a valid point we don't now the the counter to that is look you don't know you're going to get ambushed if you get it if you know you're going to get ambushed like that against you know 1500 soldiers vietnamese mm-hmm. soldiers then you would make a different decision but we don't know that we don't know that we don't have a crystal ball yeah but Here's some of Hal Moore's criticism of the way the Vietnam War was fought. And again, this is similar to Hackworth. And Hackworth eventually stood up and said this out loud during the war, which is why he got so much criticism from the Army. And also one of the reasons why I like Hackworth so much is because he did what I was talking about earlier. He was like, no, I don't believe in doing this and we're we're, we're not going to win this way. He said that. Here's what Hal Moore says. From 1964 until the American withdrawal in 1973, our objectives kept changing from political stability and preventing an enemy takeover to preserving the independence of South Vietnam and training the Arvin forces. At first, the U.S. pushed the South Vietnamese army aside and took the war over with a brand of fighting that only American forces and American logistics could support. When we left in 1973, our heritage was just that, a form of war that the South Vietnamese and its armed forces could not sustain. In the late 1970s, the Army Chief of Military History, General Douglas Kennard, wrote a book called The War Managers. He sent a questionnaire to 175 Army generals who had served in Vietnam. His book is the analysis of their replies. Nearly 70% of those generals were uncertain and unclear as to what the U.S. objective was in Vietnam. Damn. That's horrible. That's absolutely horrible. 175 generals and 70% of them didn't know what the objective was. Now, if you that's the generals, 
You take that down a step to the colonels, to the battalion commanders, to the company commanders, to the platoon commanders, to the squad leaders. Mm. You get down to the front lines and you guys have no idea what they're doing there. How do we expect to accomplish the mission when no one in the chain of command really understands what it is that the objective is, what the mission is? Mm. So, with that, Colonel Moore says a leader must have clearly defined objectives. He must ensure that these objectives are clearly understood by his subordinate leaders. Lesson learned. Here's a... Speaking of family life, There are at least five activities that must be kept in balance through proper time management. These five activities are the job, physical fitness, personal time alone, recreation, and social relationships. Also, if they apply to others, religion and family. If any of these get out of balance, then life gets out of balance. From my own personal experience and observation of others, being a workaholic is the most common area of imbalance. And again, that's what I saw a lot with, with, with the guys I used to work with. They, they're workaholics. And not only that, you know, you meet business guys all the time. You're not, you're not, uh, there's so many business guys that are workaholics. Mm-hmm. Businessmen, business women that are out there, they're grinding, they love it. And they don't wanna stop. Mm-hmm. And that's, again, that's, that's problematic. It's not, it's not the most common, but business leaders. Mm-hmm. Why are they in a leadership position? Because they built something. Why did they build something? Because they wanted to win. Because they wanted to take over. Well, that doesn't just stop at a certain point. It keeps going. It keeps yeah. growing. You reach one goal and you set another one, a higher one, a harder one. Yeah. That keeps going. You gotta be careful of that one. Balance. After Vietnam, he went and took over a base where they were running basic training and here's what he said about basic training the goal was for every man leaving basic combat training to be in the best physical shape of his life and to know it to stretch his mind and his muscles and to assist him in thereby gaining more pride in himself more self-confidence and above all more self-discipline a man who has more self-discipline has more confidence in his ability to do the job i got asked a while back and we answered it on the podcast but you know a guy said hey i took over a unit they're kind of downtrodden. What do I do to get their their pride back up? It's like, mm. yeah, work them hard. Do hard training. That's what you do. Mm. Discipline. Hard training. Give them something to brag about. Give yeah. them something to take pride in. He was dealing with Vietnam protesters when he was running that base. And he just said, guys, don't even show your weapon. No, don't even... We're going to completely underreact. We're not going to give them what they want. And that's one of his tenets here. Don't overreact and never overreact to an overreaction. <laughs> and I'm going to close this out with a pretty big chunk here. But this is when Hal Moore got back from Vietnam. He wrote a little piece called Lieutenant Leadership in Combat. And here's what he says. This is a compilation of a few of my views on leadership of and by lieutenants, specifically infantry platoon leaders in a combat zone. It will be somewhat mixed in perspective and is not possible in these few words to get across my full views on leadership. In my judgment, a leader builds over time his own unique brand of empathy or lack of it with his subordinates and creates his own leadership debits and credits with those under his orders. So you've heard me talk about leadership capital. Mm. Same thing he's talking about there, leadership debits and credits. He does not he does through he does this through personal contact and shared experience based on the interplay between leader and led, working with mixed perspectives shaped by the dynamics of real time and real life. Leadership is a highly personal, individual matter. Each leader must establish his own approach based on an internal compass using a method geared to his personality, his capabilities, but always oriented toward accomplishing the mission while knowing and taking care of his men. Now, while he says that, you got to come up with your own, your own method of leadership. They're the fundamental principles that he talks about, that we talk about all the time, that we wrote about. Those don't change. You gotta find your methodology of presenting them and carrying yourself 
but the fundamental principles are fundamental. Mm. As officers, we are given groups of men to lead. Other officers, NCOs, and enlisted soldiers. Each has a different background, different problems, a different outlook, and different duties. But no matter what their background or their previous experience, no matter how much love, care, and effort may have been spent over the years by their parents in raising them, when they are turned over to us, are now ours to care for. At that instant, the parents, teachers, or system that brought them to that point will be in the past. Their lives and future are largely in our hands. This is a terrible responsibility for a fire team leader to have, not to speak of a battalion, a division, or a corps commander. You got all these different people coming in and you're responsible for them now. And I'll tell you, I've had this conversation with business leaders too. Business leaders are the same way. Because when you're paying someone's paycheck, they're feeding their family, they're, pay, they're paying their mortgage, they're saving for their kids to go to school, they're paying their car payment. That's their life. Mm-hmm. And if you as a leader are not helping them to achieve, you're letting them down. Now, is it the exact same thing as having their actual life or death in their hand? No, it's not the same thing. But the pressure is there. Yeah. Among other attributes, I feel soldiers of any rank must have confidence in four directions. The first is to have self-confidence. Developing it leverages many resources. The primary source is expert knowledge of his assigned duties and readiness at any time to take on the next higher job. So you don't want your people just trained to do their job. You want them to be able to step up and do the next job above them in the chain of command. In addition to creating confidence through individual expertise, his superiors facilitate its development through trust in how they treat them. This is imperative. Every person's dignity must always be respected. I feel that if anyone under me fails, the fault is at least half mine. A man should never be caused to think poorly of himself, and this requires a subtle and sensitive touch by the leader, especially when taking disciplinary action. So the first thing he wants you to have is self-confidence, right? And you develop it by how you treat him. Second, but not in, priority or in, not in priority order, is the necessity for each to have complete confidence in his personal weapon as well as any other weapon he might have to handle to include using radios and, the knowing procedure, and knowing the procedures for requesting and controlling mortar and artillery fires. Developing this takes leader-controlled, leader-supervised training. So you want to be good at your job. You, you want to be expert in your job. Mm. The, the, the more expert you are in your job, the more confidence you're going to have. The third confidence in the unit and the men who are fighting. The third is confidence in the unit and the men who are fighting with him. At whatever level, the leader must strive to develop an intense esprit de corps, but never by running down other units. An example of what not to do is to permit internal subunits to be so disloyal to the organization as a whole as to critique, criticize, snipe, or run down sister units, be it a squad, platoon, or company on up. It is self-defeating and tears the unit as a whole, tears down the unit as a whole. So you want them to have esprit de corps, but you don't want them to get it by cutting down other units that are within your team. Fourth and so vital, a man must have confidence and trust in his leaders. He must know and utterly believe his leaders are competent professionals who know what they are doing and are not careless or casual in their outlook toward their responsibilities. For a subordinate to be confident in his leader, the subordinate must know the leader is aware of and appreciates what the subordinate must face and the life he must lead in performing his job. The leader must make every effort to get inside the heads of his men and see their problems and the world from their viewpoint. You gotta get the perspective of your people. You gotta understand what they're going through. 
You know, he talked about in We Were Soldiers Once When Young that in the in the Civil War, the the officers, it was like bad if you're gonna ride your horse all the time. Because you didn't understand the guys that were marching, what they're going through. And in Vietnam, some guys were riding the helicopter all the time. Some commanders would s- stay over the battlefield at 2,000 feet out of small arms range. We're safe up here. Nothing mm-hmm. can happen. But you forget what those guys are going through down there on the ground. Yeah, the gems in jujitsu. Um, the instructor that jams them up sometimes when you know when you free you're trying to teach someone something mm-hmm. and i said this before they call it the, the curse of knowledge where you don't oh uh, yeah you're so advanced you forgot what the white belt is going through yeah. in his learning you know so you start teaching stuff and you know they you forget that they need to know this stuff first before they can pick up this other stuff you know you need perspective yeah you need their perspective yeah Back to the book, this takes some doing, and while the leader cannot be intrusive into personal affairs, he must help solve personal problems, if he can, especially if the problems penalize individual or unit performance. For example, in garrison, and to some extent even in a combat area, most disciplinary problems stem from women, alcohol, firearms control, money, and vehicles. This is... This is from, from my old job. This is 100% true. Mm-hmm. Women, alcohol, f- firearms control, not so much. Money and vehicles, for sure. Yeah. Guys crashing cars, guys DUIs, guys crashing motorcycles, guys getting in trouble with girls. It, a drinking is, is encompassed in all those. Mm-hmm. Knowing this, a leader can perform a lot of preventative maintenance. As an isolated but not sole example, pay problems often arise for separated families living on limited income. Many of these can be eliminated in advance by real leadership. In summary, my views are take care of the troops, develop four-way confidence, and be professional. This ensures we can carry out our first duty accomplishment of the mission. Finally, Concerning professionalism, I believe even now the clock is bringing us closer to some few seconds, minutes, or hours in the future when the professionalism we will have or will not have will make a life or death difference for the men placed under our leadership and whose families can only trust, hope, and pray that we know our business. And again, there's more in that book, but I think we'll close it out there because what a thing to keep in your mind. Just keep that in your mind that even now the clock is bringing us closer closer to a moment when your leadership will be tested and it is your professionalism and that means your ability your mental and physical strength your knowledge your judgment it will all be tested at some point Have we done enough to prepare for that moment? Have we trained hard enough? Have we studied hard enough? Have we read enough? Have we learned enough? Are we prepared for what is coming? And I think that's all I've got for tonight so echo speaking of being prepared sure maybe you can give us some advice on getting a little more prepared sure be glad to prepared for i'll start with okay, preparation for jujitsu few mm-hmm. jujitsu references mm-hmm. jujitsu is life grappling is life jujitsu is life mm-hmm. jujitsu is life by the way there's a lot of similarities. I would say... Mm, you shouldn't say jujitsu is life. Well, if you say that, then that's cool. It's a metaphor. No, yeah. no, 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 no. But for some people, jujitsu is life. Yes. Like they're just training. Yeah. Good good for them. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It shouldn't be your whole life. You yeah. should have some other things in your life. Yeah, I didn't mean it that way. I meant it Wait, like... Ju- jujitsu you know reflects life. It's like a metaphor for life. Yes. Affirmative. Yeah, yeah. So, 
in the event of you being in jujitsu, like many people are, and more people are becoming, mm-hmm. a lot of people ask me what gi to get. <laughs> I know. Yep, I'm going into it. You get an origin gi. That's it. Mm-hmm. How many do you have? Four. Four. Okay, I have three. Okay. Every single one of them is outstanding. <laughs> yeah. Designed. Outstanding. Yeah. Designed. Designed here, though. Here. In America. In America. And the resources. By jiu-jitsu players, by the way. Yeah. The jiu-jitsu players. So I was, I watched um, one of their, one of Pete's videos. Yeah. And it was, it's, if you go to, to their YouTube channel, stuff, yep. then you know how you have the main video. Yep. It's watching that. And it made sense. You know, you see everyone that's part of the, the factory. They kind of give their input in the video a little bit. And it made sense. So like, you know, like there's a lot of geese that are made, you know, kind of thing. But if it's made by jujitsu people, mm-hmm. they're going to know. Like when mm-hmm. you put on a gi jacket, yeah. they're going to know the difference between a gi that's that whoever designed it had this in mind yeah. where when you put your hands up mm-hmm. what's that gi gonna do you know if you're just oh i'm just a, i'm gonna make a gi and they don't necessarily do jujitsu they might not pay pay attention to that kind of stuff yeah or um you know when you do jujitsu let's face it like if you do karate your body goes through a certain thing right while you're doing karate in whatever capacity if you do jujitsu your body is going to go through a certain thing and more appropriately, your gi is going to go through a certain experience. Oh, so you're saying you can't use a karate gi for the jujitsu? Yeah, that's one of the things I'm saying. So let's You'd say right. the way you put on and keep on a karate gi or a jujitsu gi is going to be going to play a role in w- when you do jujitsu. So, like, look, you tie you you know when you tie your pants or something mm-hmm. like this, how your pants are tied <laughs> matters. When you do jujitsu, true. Just like how your belt, is, when your belt is tight, it matters. Anyway, Pete and these and Origin, they kept that in mind when they yeah. designed it, and it shows too, by the way. Mm-hmm. So anyway, these are some of the reasons that you should one hundred percent get an Origin gi if you're still wondering what gi to get. More important than that, if you don't do jujitsu and that's why you don't need a gi, start jujitsu. Yeah. <laughs> then you'll need a gi. Then you'll need a gi. And then you more important you start jujitsu. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. The parallels between jujitsu and life. And you'll get in good shape. Yes. And you'll you'll learn to defend yourself in real situations. Mm-hmm. Recalibrate your instincts. Recalibrate your instincts, which are completely wrong, by the way. They're wrong. They're wrong. Yes. If you right now, if you're listening and you're thinking, you know, my instincts aren't that bad. No, I'm telling you they're yeah. wrong. Yeah. If you don't think they're wrong, go to Jujitsu Academy. Yeah. And tell them you got good instincts. Let's roll. <laughs> yeah. Here's one. In life, do you want to turn your back to your problems? In life? No, you do not. In jujitsu, do you want to turn your back to your opponent? No, you do not. Okay. But your instinct might tell you yeah. in a fight and sometimes in life, yeah. you do do it because that's what we do sometimes. See, that's where that's why how more? We're sorry. We're not listening to our instincts all the time. Not all the time. Not all the time. But if well, your we, instincts I mean, if are We listen to them. We don't follow them. Yeah. You can Unless, listen to it and that's a caution. Right, but right. no, no, no. He's saying if they're predicated on your education, experience, learning, uh, reading. Yeah, reading, yeah. Right, yeah. so essentially you are going to listen to your recalibrated instincts after you train in jiu-jitsu with your origin geek because that's the one you're going to get because that's the best one straight up. That might sound like an opinion, but it's a straight up fact. You get these <laughs> geese at originmain.com. They have some other stuff on there. Some apparel. Rash guards, compression gear. Mm-hmm. That being said, there's also other stuff. Supplemental stuff. Mm-hmm. Supplements. Okay. So krill oil. Uh, you know, we talk about the supplements that I think Jocko thinks. I'm speaking for you right now. What are good supplements? Krill oil. Joint stuff warfare. To, joint warfare. <laughs> These are things to maintain your um, structure, mm-hmm. bodily structure. Is that too scientific sounding? No, I don't think you have the capability of sounding too scientific. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, bro, I think you might be right. Nonetheless, See, that was one of those digs I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Like, I don't mean it in a bad way, but it kind of come across like I'm a jerk. Yeah, what are you saying? I'm stupid? You're no, saying I'm stupid? No, I'm just saying I'm you stupid. don't sound real scientific. Should I just not talk anymore? Some people would support that. <laughs> don't answer that. Anyway... Supplements, yes. Jocko has there's supplements. echo lovers and there's echo haters. Okay, they're both. There's two camps. 
Yeah. The, the Echo Lovers Maybe. is a bigger camp. Hopefully. The, the Echo Haters is a louder camp. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And it makes sense. You know, I, it, it, uh. the gripes, I think they come up the chain or down the chain. Both. The, yeah. Man, it makes sense. Hate. To me, if you're honest, you're honest. There it is. Nonetheless, back to supplements, Jocko has supplements. They're good supplements. Supplements Jocko actually takes. See, that's a big deal. Do what I say, not what I do. Look in this you, case, all kind, you got you got some discipline in I'm you learning. right now. You're doing all kinds of <laughs> bringing stuff back, closing the loop from the podcast. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to learn these things. That's you know, good. apply them That's to good. my life and in, the, in this particular situation, life is telling the people about joint warfare and super krill oil. Anyway, it's uh, omega threes in the krill oil. Obviously, if you don't know about krill oil, I think that krill oil ended up to be one of those sleeper. What do you call them? Sleeper supplements. You mm. know, something where you like, it, it's been going on the whole time and you, you, you didn't know about no, it. No, you didn't know about it. I've yeah. known about it. Yeah, okay, then that's me. Nonetheless, <laughs> Jocko has it, takes it. I take it and I will say 100% effectiveness, my opinion. Origin main. Scientific opinion. Scientific. Yeah, big time. <laughs> Double blind, triple blind. Um, OriginMain.com, that's where you get it. Also, for a pre mission supplement new supplement jocko supplement it's called discipline it's like a pre-workout cognitive enhancer is that accurate well yeah call it that it's pre-life life Life, yeah mission because yeah yeah, because what's your mission because i just don't need cognitive enhancement when i when i'm gonna get in the game sure i also need to have physical yeah force multiplication yeah so that's why we made it yeah because i wanted because because when i do stuff it's physical and mental yeah it's physical and mental you need to be both of those need to be tuned up yeah supplemented um, so. enhanced if you will at, at the very least it should be squared away yeah well and the good thing you can feel it yeah <laughs> See, and that works real good for jujitsu too, because jujitsu is one of those things. Let's Absolutely. face it: if I'm doing a bench press, you know, people ask me all the time, like, oh, "Do you take a pre workout in the morning?" Because I get up early in the morning and I work out. Yeah. I do not take a pre workout in the morning before I go and work out in the morning. No, oh yeah, that's you not when I take the discipline. No, I don't drink coffee. I, I go in there, I drink water, I brush my teeth, I drink water. Go. Then I go and and do my morning workout. So I do not take a pre workout or a nootropic prior to working out in the morning. However, for the jiu-jitsu, yeah. there is a, I would say I'm about 60 or 70% of the time, mm-hmm. I'm on on the discipline when I go in discipline. there. Yeah. yeah. Because you can feel it. Like, it, you can feel better. Like, why not have good training? Yeah. And that That's seems like jiu-jitsu is one of those things, like life, is one of those things where the, the, this kind of supplement makes... 100% sense because it is physical and mental and not just, oh, you know, like everything's mental. I get it. Yeah. Your brain drives it. I get it. It's true. Even if you're doing, you know, bench press or whatever, it's still mental for sure. But jujitsu is like your mind has to be going at the same pace. You know, you, you're using your mind just as much, if yeah. not more during jujitsu. Yeah. And you're using your body, by the way. I think if you were going to do, okay, so in the mornings, I don't need it. Yeah, bro. I don't need it. <laughs> like I yeah. don't. In the morning, I'm ready. Like I wake up, yeah. and and I'm like ready to ready. rock and roll. I don't. I'm. Get, I'm gonna get in there. I'm gonna get it. Get it. Yeah. I will say this during uh, over the Christmas time, mm-hmm. some of my workouts in the morning because I had other responsibilities during that time period. Because you got early morning tactical things that you're doing around sure. Christmas, etc. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And because you got kids and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And so some of my workouts were, and then in the af- when I was working on the afternoon, I was getting on the discipline in the afternoon because it's not the morning time anymore. And I yeah, need a little yeah. bit of... So you're like one of those guys something. who like, you know how certain people, they have their, their like, uh, what do you call it? It's like time of day where their yeah, performance yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of yeah. kind of peaks their potential. I don't whatever. think, I think my performance actually peaks in the afternoon like most people. I think that's the most common time. Yeah. But in the morning when I get up, I'm ready to rock and roll. Is yeah. what I'm saying. I don't. I just want to get in there and get it done. Like I'm. I feel like I missed out a bunch of stuff when I was sleeping. 
Oh, for real? <laughs> yeah. Like, what just happened? I kind of feel the opposite. I feel like when I'm working out, I'm like, dang, I could be sleeping. Right now. <laughs> there <laughs> you go. Just on my nap. You need discipline for that. workouts. Man. Nonetheless, it's called discipline. A pre-mission. We'll call it a pre-mission. Yes. Supplement. Yes. It's good. It's a good, good name Check for it. Check out that one. OriginMain.com. That's where you get it. Also, for kick-ass fitness gear. On it.com slash Jocko. I get the kettlebells. I have the kettlebells. My collection is grow. I'm going for all of them. That's my collect. That's my 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 goal. Clear and concise goal. Anyway, if you want a if you want to make your workout routine more interesting, there's a lot of cool stuff on there. Battle ropes, maces, and you can look up all the workouts you want to do. I think that's a big deal for people unlike you, by the way, who don't mind doing the boom 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 routine routine routine. You want to mix it up. Mm. That's what I think. Anyway, on it.com slash Jocko. That's where you can get them. Awesome stuff. Also, when you get the book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, and also Hal Moore on Leadership Winning When Outgunned and Outmanned. That's what it's called. When you're getting these books, don't worry. I have the list of books, including this one. By episode on the website, jockopodcast.com. While you're doing that, make a note to yourself that you need to put the link to the new extreme ownership because somebody tweeted me that you have the old extreme ownership linked in there, which okay. is not good for Dang. you, or are you guys, for me. Are you guys selling the old one? I don't think you can get it anymore. Dang. Yeah. Okay. If you can get it, well, no, I don't think you can get it anymore. Just the new one. All I right. think it's sold out. All right, there you go. Boom, yet another book on the list. And that list is at, like I said, jockopodcast.com. Go to the top on the menu there. Click on books. Boom, all the books, including the ones we, the one we went over today. Extreme Ownership. I'm going to call it the new one. What do you call What's the official? The new one. The new one, that's yeah. it. No, no, it's the re-release. Revised. The re-release. re-release. Yeah, yeah. The black one. The black one. The one with the black cover. Yeah, it's got the black cover. Yeah, there it is. Anyway, either way. Yeah. It's Get got it the new one has excerpts from the podcast when we talk about leadership on the podcast. The really prominent questions, right. put some of those included. in there. They're, they're included in there. there you go. And there's also a new forward. And there's new pictures in there. Color pictures. Dang, I held the violation. line, tried to hold the line. Yeah, it didn't work out. It's color good. pictures. The color there. pictures are cool, man. Don't For them, it's a step up. For me, it's a step down. <laughs> I go. Yeah. I don't mind the colored pictures. I think they're cool. Um, but yeah, there it is. Nonetheless, you can get it all on jockopodcast.com in the book section. Click on there. It's a good way to support. Boom, takes it to Amazon. Do some shopping on there with these books here or whatever else. Hey, carry on. That's how. Also, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, all these podcasting providing platforms. If you haven't already, leave a review. If you're in the mood, if you're in the mood, if you're compelled to, leave a review. Also, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. I haven't read any podcast reviews on the podcast in a long time. So if maybe this, there's some really good ones. I'll yeah. break them out. Yeah. I don't <laughs> some know. Some really funny ones. Yeah, there's very good. There's some funny ones. Yeah. That's like... um. Like good doesn't mean like, hey, this is the best podcast ever. Good right, means yeah. you're just... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah, do yeah. something that's funny and creative and still good. Yes, of course. Well... Because in your way of saying good, it can still be a negative review as long as it's good, a good one. Yeah, sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I don't recommend it, obviously. Mm. But <laughs> as far as your uh, criteria for the word good in this specific case, good. Good. Good, good review. Good review. Entertaining, I should say. Entertaining. There There's it some is. Entertaining. There it is. Same with, same with on Amazon. Yes. There's some entertaining reviews. A lot of energy. I've read some of those. I'll read some more of those because yeah, they're good. Yeah. People put time and effort into those. Yeah, yeah, they do for sure. And their and their sense of humor. Yeah, I support that too. By the way, also, like I said, YouTube. It's great. We have a YouTube channel, Jocko Podcast. That's what it's called. That's what it's called. YouTube channel. Boom. Got some excerpts on there. If you'd want to necessarily watch the whole two, three hour podcast video format, some excerpts on there. You can take specific lessons. Boom. All on the YouTube channel. Most of them, all of them, most of them. Nonetheless, um, also That's a tiny fraction of them actually. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> some of them we'll say. Also, there are, are deleted scenes. Yeah, Every that's... once in a while, I'll put some deleted scenes if you care or are interested in what Jocko 
digs at me about mm. while we're not actually technically we're recording but it, it's not part of the yeah. podcast pre-recording pre-recording recording. yeah if you're interested in that kind of stuff it's on the youtube every once in a while i'll post them also jocko has a store it's called jocko store obviously this is where you can get if you want the shirts shirts hoodies maybe some hats on there rash guards Strangely, a lot of people have been hitting me up for rash guards, and I've been seeing them out in the wild mm. way more recently. Yeah. People are getting after it big time. <laughs> warrior Kid rash guards are on there for the youth, youth sizes. For the warrior kids. For the, the warrior world. kids. Yeah, exactly right. Boom, they're up, up, shipping, going out already. Um, also, we have a new one on there. Just if you want any of this stuff, this is where you can get them. JockoStore.com. Some good stuff, girl stuff on the women stuff on there. Also, Psychological warfare. If you don't know what that is, I know. I've explained it before, but in the event of you not hearing it yet, this is what it is. It's an album with tracks, not songs. They're Jocko tracks. So basically, what these tracks are for are in <laughs> your in your. I thought you were gonna keep it concise what? for a moment. No, there. no. Well, here's the thing. I think is important. Gonna, you know why? Yeah, let's see if you can do it in ten seconds. No, go. I can't do it in ten, ten seconds. I'm not gonna do our people the disservice of making it ten seconds. I'll you be know quiet. why? I'll be this quiet. this is this product was made for me. Mm. This is my product essentially. True statement. When it comes down to it, so when you come, okay, here's what it is. When you come across your moments of weakness in life. Kind of sounded like you right there, didn't it? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Weakness in life. Like, you know, you're waking up early, right? You want to keep it consistent all year. New year, new me. Waking up early every single day. Maybe not on Sundays. Or maybe Sundays too. I don't know. Whatever. Either way. When you wake up, sometimes you're not going to feel like it. Sometimes you're going to want to hit the snooze. Boom. Put in one of these tracks. It's Jocko on there telling you pragmatically giving you practical advice on why you shouldn't hit the snooze same thing with skipping workouts same thing with cheating on the diet do you call it cheating on the diet i don't know what you call it i call it eating donuts eating donuts <laughs> slipping on the diet you know hitting these speed bumps weakness speed bumps is what they are speed bumps i had some chocolate the, chip i had some chocolate cake with mint chocolate chip ice cream on the holidays and it was good how many go. times more than once no i you, you know what i had twice in the same mm, situation oh dang, like, two like right there like boom i'm back again B boom like good, two hits yeah. and boom said goodbye it was like chocolate cake with mint chocolate chip ice cream which is not normal so that's why it kind of yeah. got me i wasn't listening to psychological no, warfare at the time. You needed, <laughs> see that's a perfect example where actually that's not a perfect example because i'm sure you were kind of like hey freedom yeah that was the freedom you were the freedom you part were, of discipline equals freedom. yes you're exercising the freedom part this is for times where like you're at work i'm actually fasting right now other than having some jocko white tea and some discipline yeah i'm, I'm fasting yeah people some people are like there's no fasting <laughs> whatever <laughs> i think i go from right, eating twenty seven thousand calories a day to uh -huh. eating four still, calories a day still not fasting i think fasting yeah. is zero I don't know. I'm not a fasting expert. Either way, what this is about, what uh, um, psychological warfare, what, what. You were done. Who it's for. No, 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 no. <laughs> you were no, done. Bro, the whole explanation is not even done. <sighs> we're still unclear you about done. what it is. No, no, no. Yeah, you album tracks. You said, no, you said, you used the example of you eating chocolate mint cake. Chocolate cake. And with mint chocolate ice cream. With ice cream as one so of the good. scenarios <laughs> <laughs> you said. The chocolate uh, cake had like a hard shell of chocolate on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was legit. Yeah. That is a, well, yeah. the reason I asked how and the many mint times. the ice cream was kind of melted a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's how. Yeah, that's good. Or you do it with like a brownie. So it melts oh, like yeah, naturally good, yeah. onto. It's kind of the same, there's same a, time that. There's dynamic. a restaurant in San Diego, OB, California. It's called Raglan. <laughs> and they have something there called the Illegal. Yeah. Because it's so good that it should be, should legal, be legal, right? And it is, it's a, it's no big deal, right? This is what makes it so good, is it's uh -huh. just the, uh, a little cast iron pan. Just yeah. a little cast iron pan, uh -huh. and they cook a chocolate, chocolate chip cookie, cookie in yeah. there, and then they put yeah. vanilla ice cream on it. Yeah. 
that thing is should legit. be illegal. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that might be you know what might psychological warfare might not work against not the even oh, at, at Raglan. Dang, that's <laughs> so watch lot, out bro. for that one. That's saying a lot because as of right now I think it's one hundred percent success rate. Actually hundred one percent. I so Pretty I heard good. I heard out in the field reports. But you were saying you were saying Saying what? That that's the example when to use it. It's not. Oh. The example is when you're on the path, but you feel like the moment of weakness. Oh, okay. I don't think the chocolate so chip. That was a conscious decision of. Yeah, you know, it's the yeah, holidays. Yeah, I'm going to do this, you know, this. kind of thing. I'm going to exercise my freedom because of all my discipline, all that. It's like when you're at work, it's not lunchtime yet. It's almost lunchtime, but not quite yet. Boom, they got the donuts, right? Because mm-hmm. there's some big office meeting. They mm-hmm. want to cater, you know, whatever. Yeah. It's that kind of situation. Because you don't have That's what's good, dude. That's what's good. Fasting, recalibrate that that little hunger vibe. Unless you hit a speed bump of weakness during the fast. Yeah. Then Which you can, you can by the way. Part. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Like peanut butter. Like you ever been fasting? The biggest thing, I think the biggest thing somebody was asking me about it the other day, um, the th- the reason he's like what's the, what's the hardest part like the first eight hours the first 12 hours the first 24 hours and i was like the hardest part of a fast mm. is the parts where you're not doing something yeah yeah like it's i haven't thought about eating one time during while we've been recording this podcast yeah. i haven't thought about eating one time yeah when we get done and we square ourselves away and you leave yeah i'm gonna hey, be like oh eat. cool what am i gonna do now <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah yeah but then if i was to go from here and like drive t- to go do something i wouldn't right. think about it are you talking on the phone yeah you got something going on what yeah. <laughs> what um how long is this i don't know i think i'm going? actually gonna eat this afternoon or this evening oh so you're like hey i'm just gonna fast what do you have a minimum amount obviously. no i'll do like 24 hours usually yeah. i do 24 hours once a month and then i'll do 72 hours once a quarter Dang, yeah, so I'll have I'll have a few handfuls of mixed nuts. Yeah, like throughout the day, I'll grab a handful of mixed nuts. I'll have some tea, some chocolate white tea, by the sure. way. Uh, this is the first one where I've done discipline, which I think is really good because it's it's make, making me feel great. So yeah. and like uh, there's no calories in it, or there's one calorie or something really right, right. small in there. Incidental um, calorie. Yeah, but yeah, and and recalibrate your hunger sensitivities and man i feel good when i do it so have you done it you yeah. do 24 hour fast yeah. you feel good well, right you uh, feel good yeah. or no i d- here's the here's the thing wait wait 24 hours yeah i've done 24 yeah, yeah plenty, Tw- I, plenty see, I do 24 hours. i actually probably do 24 hours more than once a month because a lot of times i'll just wake up i'll, I'll be traveling and i just won't eat yeah and so i ate the night before i wake up early in the morning i go i travel i get somewhere at night and then i eat dinner well that means i just went 24 hours without eating yeah yeah, and that's a kind of essentially kind of how it happened for me early on. But after a while, you're like, you know, the kind where you're like, dang, I totally miss lunch, but I don't want to eat now because I won't be hungry for dinner with the family mm-hmm. kind of thing. So I'm like, hey, I'm not going to eat. Then I'm like, wait, hold on, I just went 24 hours. You, you know what I've noticed this time? And like I said, it's only been 36 hours right now. But what I've noticed this time is the actual, I felt good about exercising discipline. Like I felt good about like, I'm not eating that because maybe yeah, it's yeah. because because I just I'm, I've been thinking to myself like yeah I don't need to eat right now and that feels good I've been actually enjoying the discipline of it yeah which yeah. is uh, normally I don't enjoy the discipline of it normally I haven't th- not that I don't I've never even thought about it before this yeah. time I've been like yes yeah that makes sense I'll shut you down kind of and I strong. do remember I know I don't talk about seal training a lot but when you go through hell week which is like when you stay awake for five days. Yeah. One of the things that I thought about when I was going through Hell Week was like, oh, it's gonna feel so good to sleep when I get done with this that yeah. it kind of made me feel good to do it. Like I was like, oh man, can you imagine how good it's gonna feel when I get right. done with this? I could go yeah, to yeah. sleep and it's gonna feel, feel so yeah. good. And right now I'm kind of like the same thing. I'm kind of thinking, oh, it feels so good to not to not eat right now because yeah. in two days I'm gonna eat and it's gonna yeah, feel yeah, good. It's gonna be you know? solid. Yeah, it's the same way I feel strangely, not strangely, but same way I feel when I go on vacation where I'm like, if I didn't do a, lo- a lot of work for the, you know, the past months or whatever, like let's say work is like kind of cruise. We'll say like it didn't like test me. You know how like if I shoot, all day, like at the muster, I'm kind of shooting all day from yeah. 4.30 all the When he talks about night. shooting everyone, he's talking about taking pictures and videos. Because <laughs> I'm like, where are you shooting? <laughs> what's, no, what's yeah, I don't, I don't shoot guns for, no, I don't. 
nonetheless well you do a few musters you make some big you know in my case you know you do work and then you're like oh you're looking forward to that vacation kind of thing um, but if it's like oh you have a trip plan but you haven't been working that hard you're like the brown one i like i want to stock up on a bunch of hard hard work so i can enjoy that vacation mm. you know what i mean so the vacation yeah. seems more appealing same, same thing. idea yeah yeah, yeah. feels good feels yeah. good give it a try check with your doctors right i guess what <laughs> before you fast yeah sure but yeah. nonetheless if, if, if back to the speed bump thing if you hit your moments Dude, of there's weakness, no way you can carry this thread all the way back to psychological why warfare. psychological warfare is good because sometimes you hit those moments all of that you've said about it you never said hey you can get it on apple itunes Amazon Music. You never even gave out the goods. Not yet. <laughs> I was about to big time. I was about to demonstrate the whole thing, but you already did, and I thank you for it. Because now did we it quick. can do it. Yeah. All right. Hey. Also on Amazon, you can get Jocko White Tea, which uh, you know there's been a lot of scientific studies done, mm-hmm. and a lot of people have tried it. We have witnesses. You can absolutely deadlift eight thousand pounds, including Jordan Peterson, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's been now deadlifting. He was only deadlifting seven thousand pounds before. And this is coming from him. Yeah. Sure now enough. he's deadlifting 8,000 pounds. So that's good. Jocko White Tea. There's some great reviews on there. You might want to read those. Uh, we got some books. Way the Warrior Kid shows kids the path. The next Warrior Kid book is coming out April 28th. So you can, well, I'll let you know when you can get that. I don't know when you can right now, but that's when it's coming out. I'm done writing it, just doing editing now. And. Also, there's the book we talked about earlier, Extreme Ownership, written by me and my brother Leif Babin, and the new edition's out, Combat Leadership for Business and Life. There's a lot of lessons in there. You can learn from it. I learned from it. Also, the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. And when you say that, you gotta say it like that. <laughs> because sometimes people don't, don't wanna say field manual. Why not? But someone pointed out, I don't know. They just say, oh, Dis- discipline equals freedom. Yeah. Discipline equals freedom, field manual. Yeah. Uh, a guy said today on social media, on Twitter, he hit, he hit it up and he said, hey, it's a field manual. It's mm-hmm. not a book. You don't read from cover to cover. It's a field manual. So you yeah. take it out when you need it. Yeah. You refer to it. You go through it. Maybe you go through it one time because it's not yeah. long. Right. Not a long read. Mm-hmm. This ain't about face. By Colonel David Hackworth. You can probably read this in two hours. Sure. Three hours. Sure. Then once you've read it, you go back to it. Yeah. The field manual. Teaching you how to get after it mentally and physically. Mm -hmm. The thoughts and actions that you can take to get better. Opportune time. A lot of people got it for Christmas. Now they're implementing New Year's. Good. New Year's resolution. Yeah. Also, a lot of people still asking for the audio version of the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. It is not on Audible. It is on iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play, and other MP3 broadcasting platforms. That's where you can get it. If you need further implementation, in your business or your organization or your team beyond the podcast and beyond the books. We have Echelon Front, which is our leadership consulting company. It's me, Leif Babin, JP Dinell, Dave Burke. Email info at echelonfront.com or check out the website echelonfront.com. On top of that, we have the muster. The muster is a leadership gathering. Yeah. It's in Washington, D.C., May 17th and 18th. It is in San Francisco, October 17th and 18th. Come and get it. You can register at extremeownership.com. And if you need to follow up with us with questions or answers or comments or just to cruise, that's cool. We are actually on the interwebs, Twitter. Instagram and the face echo is at echo Charles and I am at Jocko Willink and thank you for listening to the show and thanks to those of you that are listening that make this show possible those of you in the armed services that are out there on the front lines worldwide keeping peace and protecting our freedoms to police 
law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, and uh, other first responders. Thanks for holding the line here at home and keeping our families safe. Thank you for your service as well. And to everyone, remember that even now, the clock is bringing us closer. Closer to that moment. So, train hard and work hard and do everything you can to be prepared so when that time does come, you can step up and get after it. So, until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.